<clears throat> By Jove, they think they've done it. Could Florida State have just found the loophole to get out of the ACC? Could this be the first domino of the ACC's inevitable implosion? Are the all cupcakes conference going to be squashed and left upside down on the street? Well, Florida State has filed a follow-up complaint against the ACC. We'll tell you all about it right here on Wire to Wire, a brand new show with Diesel and Cole Bryson on the Fan Upstate. If you're listening on uh, on terrestrial radio, 97.7 FM in Greenville, we thank you. If you're listening on 97.1 FM in Spartanburg, we thank you. If you're listening on the free Odyssey app, we appreciate that as well. If you're catching this show after the fact, after hours on demand on the Odyssey app, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Spotify, we appreciate you as well. Cole, do you think this is it? Before we even get into what's going on, you've been briefed right. on what's going on with Florida State. Do you believe that this is the smoking gun that will get them out? From what I've read um, that you've sent me and from other places, Diesel, I don't know that this is the absolute smoking gun, but mm -hmm. I, when I do read the articles about uh, their – lawsuit i do think that at the end of the day this will be what puts them over the edge to get out because from what i've read they're 100 percent getting out now the only thing that i don't know when it comes to florida state and, and i don't know if you could elaborate uh the fsu lawsuit that was filed in on december 22nd diesel in leon county it described 500 million dollars yep. And penalties. Yeah. So, so where this, does that go? This is going to drastically, drastically reduce the penalty to get out. If the court sees it Florida State's way, this could drastically reduce the amount of money that Florida State, Clemson, and potentially the other five of the Magnificent Seven would have to pay if they exited the ACC. So uh, we're going to mix in some legal quotes from the briefings. We're going to try to explain to you exactly what's going on in lay terms, and we'll have you decide. We'll let you jump in on the text line, 71307. Start your text with keyword fan or hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, or X, or Twitter is X, Facebook, X, or YouTube in the comment section and let us know. So here's what's going on with Florida State. The ACC has asked for the Leon County case to be paused while North Carolina Judge Louis A. Bledsoe III, what a great name, rules on Florida State's request to stay or dismiss the conference's lawsuit in that state arguments were heard uh that that on that motion last friday and a decision is expected to be delivered before april 9th which is when florida state's uh case is scheduled to begin florida state points out that the acc acc still hasn't provided the judge in north carolina with its television contracts with espn which would be meet which would be needed to make an informed decision we talk about the grant of rights and how ironclad this thing is. And to this point, we've essentially just taken the ACC's word for it. And that is basically the point that Florida state is trying to make Florida state sued. The ACC is requesting a dismissal of Florida state suit. Florida state claims that the ACC hasn't provided the judge with the contract saying, quote, the sound and fury in three different state courts. That would be Florida, South Carolina, and North Carolina. Uh, are largely over lengthy contracts no one, including the courts, has other than the ACC. The ACC asks these courts to construe the terms and conditions of those ESPN agreements, yet expects those courts to take the ACC's word for those terms. That never ends well. The record thus far demonstrates the extreme hazard of taking the ACC's word for it. So basically, Florida State's attorneys say the ACC has deceived the court with its interpretation of the, quote, commercially, commercially reasonable efforts clause, claiming that it doesn't require the ACC to take action, which is to sue Florida State, to counter sue Florida State, but that the ACC chose to. And Florida State claims the conference has been duplicitous when it accuses the university of, vi of violating confidentiality agreements with the league and ESPN. Quote, the most substantial mis misinterpretation concerns whether the ESPN agreements refer to the television rights for Florida State's home football games at all. This is where this gets really, really interesting, Cole. This is this is the meat and potatoes of this. Okay, okay. Uh, ESPN agreements extend only to home games played while Florida State remains 
a, quote, conference institution. After its exit, Florida State will cease to be a conference institution. If the ESPN agreements have no application to the disputed property, which would be Florida State's media rights, then its taking is in no way necessary for the conference to perform the contractual obligations of the conference expressly set forth in the ESPN agreement. You're saying, is that what, what the hell does that mean? Mm-hmm. Florida State is saying, this is, this is the lawyers presenting the argument, that the ACC doesn't have the right to take Florida State's media rights earnings after it leaves the conference, which as of right now, which includes exit fees and their their grant of media rights through 2036 is estimated at $550 million. Florida State is essentially saying, if we up and leave, you don't have the right, despite it being in the conference, uh, despite it being in the contract, you don't have the right to take our media, media money going forward. So whether Florida State is an independent and they, they, cobble together some sort of uh, television contract in the state of Florida or in the region in the Southeast, or if they get into the SEC, Big Ten, Big 12, whatever it may be, that's the crux of this issue. That's what's uh, that's supposedly keeping these schools in the ACC, that if Florida State, Clemson, Miami, North Carolina, et cetera, leave, they scatter, they go to their own conferences, the ACC would still own their media payouts through 2036. That's where the $550 million figure comes from quote distilled to its essence the fsu board and the acc dispute who takes ownership of certain property media rights money after florida state exits the acc do you can you explain to me though like i hear what you're saying but where where does florida state and i guess maybe it comes with them winning the lawsuit where does that 550 million or whatever exit penalties how does that just all of a sudden get abolished well they're saying that so The ACC bylaw is not the bylaws, excuse me. The grant of rights agreement Mm -hmm. states that if any if any team leaves the conference, right, whatever media money they make through 2036, wherever it is they go, the SEC, Big Ten, Big Twelve, belongs to the ACC. Mm -hmm. They have to pay the ACC that money. That is the penalty for leaving early. This exorbitant amount of money, which currently sits at 550 million, is is seen to be just a, an, an enormous amount of money, and no school would ever pay that kind of money yeah. to leave their conference, and no no school would ever go through twenty thirty six without making any money. You couldn't survive right as a university as an athletic department going forward with that. Um, so it says here the um, the incidents bring into sharp focus that the ACC's game of hide the ball must end. This is Florida State's lawyers saying this. The ACC's motion to stay discovery must be denied and discovery must instead be accelerated. Florida State contends that these are the same arguments Clemson is making in their case in Pickens County in South Carolina. So uh, that's what's really interesting about this is Florida State basically says, if we dip, you don't have the right to take our property, our money, right? And what's really interesting about these filings is for the very first time in any fly, any filing Florida State has made in this whole effort to get out of the ACC, this is the first time they've ever stated it is our 100% intention to get out of the ACC. There had been language in there that said, well, if you get our revenue distribution system right, maybe we'll come back, maybe we'll be happy with this. Florida State is hell-bent on getting out of the ACC. That we know now. They have essentially they have essentially turned that corner. Right. They have said, screw this. We are out no matter what. So this has gotten awfully saucy between Florida State and the ACC. And why I say, Cole, that this could be the domino that really pushes these seven schools to get out is if Florida State is able to successfully argue that the ACC doesn't have the right to take revenue they generate then what's to keep anyone anywhere? I just don't know that that happens, though. I mean, does the ACC, does as easy as you make that sound, does the ACC just let them walk? I mean, th- that's an awful lot of money. Well, certainly the ACC is going to countersue and argue against this. It all depends on what happens in the court of Leon County in Florida. And what's extra interesting about this, of course, is there would be an in-state precedent in Florida law that Miami could also exploit. 
Yeah, I don't see I don't see Florida State or Clemson winning. Do you? Winning? No, I I, I don't. I think ultimately this I think comes o- down to how do we reduce our payout? Okay. How do we get the ACC to settle? Gotcha. Instead of saying it's five hundred fifty million dollars, the ACC will ultimately say, "Okay, guys, we really we know that you really really want out, so we'll let you out for two fifty instead of five hundred million dollars." And then they'd have to just pay that. I think that's ultimately where this is going to go. From everyone again, I wonder what that number would be. Though again, we've never read the ACC's grant of rights. Anybody who says they have knowledge of the ACC's grant of rights is lying. They don't know. They they read what the ACC is telling us. Yeah. But no one has access to these contracts. No one can read this. Up until this point, it seems to be pretty ironclad. It's a lot of people's opinion that it is ironclad, but we don't know this because nobody can read it, not even the courts who are supposed to be litigating this. Now, the only thing I would say, though, like, Whoever, if it's Florida State leading the charge, Diesel, um, to to kind of what you said earlier, it may, and I could be wrong when I say this, if Florida State leads the charge, would that allow other schools like Clemson, would it make it easier on those schools maybe? Because – yeah. There would be legal precedent for saying we don't actually owe you the $550 million that you think we owe you. Yeah, but both both Clemson and Florida State would probably have to pay, pay close to the same amount I'm because sure. because of the size of the – I mean, I mean they're, would, those two are making more money than the other guys, right? You would think that there would be a similar negotiation, okay. but, who, but who knows? Yeah. I mean, who, who knows if the ACC would let Clemson out for the same amount they let Florida State out or North Carolina right. or Virginia. That's true for that matter. But basically, this is Florida State saying, we're going to burn the whole thing down. They're saying, I'll put the system on trial. Yeah. We're going to put the system on trial. We can we can blow up this whole contract. It would probably also, I guess, depend on how much those two teams are like. When I talk about the price of getting out, it would probably depend on how much those two teams are generating for the conference, yep. for their media right deals. I think it's interesting. I do think that whether Florida State gets out first or Clemson gets out first, don't we both agree? And I would like to know what the textures think as well. 71307, start your message with fan. At this point, from what we're reading about the lawsuit with FSU, it seems inevitable. But I guess the biggest question is how long do we have to wait? How long or oh, how soon will it happen? That's a fantastic question. I mean, could you imagine? Could you imagine if it was Florida State in the Sweet 16 and not Clemson. Now, Florida State has certainly rattled the Sabres a lot more than Clemson has, but Clemson has done their fair share of it. Right. Florida State's just been doing it for longer. Now, it's 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 fascinating to watch Jim Phillips in the crowd watching Clemson, right? Watching an institution that's trying to get out of its conference make a deep run into the tournament. But could you imagine if Florida State was there as well? Man, that would be spicy. There's no way, though, like... Him watching those games, I saw the picture the other day. Like, uh, he's sitting on – he's got to be – you would think that Jim Phillips is sitting there thinking there's no way that if Clemson and FSU gets out the, – the ACC, as I said the other day, the ACC is we know it is, it's over. It's done. It's gone. It's no more. I don't think it will exist. You might as well just blow it up. Texter wants to know here at 72341. He started his text with keyword fan. You can do the same thing. Remember, anytime you text in on topic, we automatically get to your text messages. If you text in off topic, you wait until the end of the hour or the end of the show. Texter asks, how many days y'all going to talk about this conference stuff? Texter, we're going to talk about it every day as long as spicy stuff like this is happening. Spicy, baby. Yeah. Uh, Texter here says the ACC, not knowing that the schools want to leave, would do well to let them go and come to a settlement agreement before making this worse. Yeah, I do wonder what the ACC thinks they're going to gain out of this. If the ACC continues to fight this and countersue its member institutions, well, then it's inevitable in 2036 they're all going to leave no matter what. Let's just say this thing is so ironclad that no one could leave at all until 2036. Well, when that happens, everybody's going to leave. 2036. Because you've held everybody there against their will for essentially 12 years. What's ridiculous, though, is that we could be sitting here talking about this and, and Florida State filing a lawsuit, Clemson doing the same, and, and now all of a sudden <laughs> you might be talking about 12 years. Yeah. I mean, that would be miserable. Yeah. That would be absolutely miserable. 
A texter says SMU and those other two schools sitting back like, oh, crap, we just joined the dying conference. <laughs> it's like – it's like um, You think? Yeah, it's like in the cartoons when you would see the, the character jump onto a little piece of an iceberg that just breaks into smaller and smaller pieces, and they're standing on a smaller and smaller piece of, of, uh, of ice. Right. That's what this is. That's what this is. This is like this is a fascinating soap opera. And I don't understand this texter who's like, eh, blase, not really all that into it. Meh. I don't understand you, texter. This is fascinating to me. This all right. Is like better call Saul stuff to me. It is. It is. And, and and I guess when it comes down to it, because it involves Clemson and because what we saw from the from the FSU lawsuit, I think that's what, you know, I, I think that's what makes it so so fascinating, uh, bringing it back to a local sense. And you know, if Clemson, if Clemson weren't one of the two parties pushing to get out, I don't know that it would be. But with Clemson involved, it you know, it, at the forefront of it, it it, it absolutely is. Texter says uh, this comes from Mongo. Over under, how many years Dabo has left when they become an SEC eight and five Liberty Bowl team? Oof. Ooh, Mongo throwing shade early. I like it. Um, I'm not sure that that happens. Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Mongo, but uh, thanks for the text. Uh, texter here says. Guys, uh, hey guys, it's Jared. Where do you think Clemson and Florida State go? Like what conference or will it just be one huge conference per se? Well, we talked about this a lot yesterday on the show. Right. Uh, we talked about, I think, the more likely and tenable landing spot would be the Big 12. If if what we're hearing is correct, mm -hmm. that the SEC really doesn't want them, do you really want to be in the Big 10? No. There's more money up there, but neither Clemson or Florida State are considered educational uh, academic powerhouses. And I don't know. Big Ten really seems to like that. I don't know if anybody wants to be in the Big Ten. <laughs> I mean, who? That's coast to coast travel. Who's ever said I want to be in the Big Ten? Uh, speaking of Clemson, though, Diesel, what a day for Clemson. Well, oh, yeah. what could be a day for Clemson? As uh, Clemson tonight has an opportunity to punch their ticket to the Elite Eight. Have we ever said that before? Have we ever said that before? Five hours from now, Diesel. Clemson fans could have a very, very good experience. They could also, you know, be having a not so good experience. We'll find out what experience they will have. We'll tell you next what experience we think they will be having five hours from now. Clemson, Arizona, Sweet 16 tonight. This is Wire to Wire on the Phantom State.
What a night it could be for Clemson fans if things were to go their way. However, Arizona is going to try their best, Diesel. Arizona is a very good team. You talked about it a few days ago, how Arizona can score the basketball. It'll be interesting to see if that trend continues. However, five hours from right now, Clemson fans are either going to be looking back on a very good basketball season and thinking, you know what, Sweet 16, it's better than, you know, what we've experienced the last few years. We're content. It's, it's, it is what it is. Or they're going to be living in, in the glory days of Clemson basketball. Now, are you telling me that it's this easy to be living in the glory days of Clemson basketball? Well, yeah, when you haven't really done anything, wouldn't you consider an elite eight the glory days since this is probably the best team Clemson's had in a very long time? I would say so. So five hours from right now, if you have listened, if you have turned it on and left it on like we encourage you to do throughout the week, you would know that, I am picking Clemson. Diesel, I did see where you said that you are going the other way. Is that right? I am taking the Arizona Wildcats in this game, and I think they've just got too much firepower. The way they play is not really going to be set up and be conducive for Clemson to be successful unless Clemson plays the best defensive game they played all season. Well, they're going to have to. And if they do, if they were to pull this out, I did something that I wanted to share with you, Diesel, and share with our audience as well. If Clemson were to win tonight, the game comes on at 7 o'clock. So we expect it to end around 9. So five hours from right now, Clemson will hopefully, for our sake, be experiencing uh, an Elite Eight berth, right? Playing in the Elite Eight, they'll be waiting on their opponent. Where would that rank in all-time Clemson athletic success? I did a little bit of a ranking system to see if you agree with it, Diesel, and also see if our listeners agree with it. You can text the show again, 71307. The phone lines are also open, 844-FAN-PHONE. That's 844-326-3663 is the number to get in touch with the program. I think we can all agree that the number one, the climax of Clemson Athletics was their first national championship in football. Whenever you win the first one, Diesel, I think it's always going to be at the top, right? Once you get the monkey off your back, I have the 1981 national championship being the most significant uh, accomplishment of Clemson athletics. I then have the 2016 football national championship as number two because a lot of people were not alive for the 1981 national championship. They experienced the 2016 National Championship with Deshaun Watson and felt like that was their first Clemson natty, right? And then the 2018 Football National Championship I have as third. And then, you know, after third, you can rank kind of how you want. Clemson's won two recent national championships in soccer. That's something that's really not talked about, even though it's very, very impressive. It's something that's not talked about a ton. Um, In 2000, 2002, 2006, and 2010, they made the College World Series. We all remember how the 2010 College World Series went. Obviously not good, and especially who it was against. But, Diesel, if you were to make an Elite Eight, if you were to win tonight and Brad Brownell, of all coaches, gets you to an Elite Eight, where, in your opinion, does this rank in all-time Clemson athletic success, or does it even rank? Oh, it certainly does. Um, before I get to that, though, a uh, little bit of breaking news here. Mike Trout has just hit the first home run of the 2024 Bam. Major League Baseball season. We already got balls flying out of the park. Uh, hey, by the way, drug test tomorrow, Mike. <laughs> I would I would contend with you, Cole, and say that the 2018 title is probably bigger than the 81 title. Oh, really? I, I know that Clemson was uh, was elite. Uh, were, they, were, they, were they were they elite in 80 or were they elite in 82? Like I had a really, really good football team in one of those seasons, either the mm-hmm. one leading up or the one yeah. afterwards. But I would say 2018 is probably more impactful just because you were in the middle of that Clemson dynasty. It, it kind of felt like Alabama. Yeah. You felt like you were on top of the world. You felt like you were absolutely untouchable. So, I mean, I would, you know, that's mincing words, though, to, to put, say, all right, well, I would push 2018 to one, put 81 down to three. That's just me. Uh, but but making an elite eight, that's certainly it. Definitely goes above soccer, yeah, it right? Goes above soccer. That's that's for sure. Um, you know, you win a you win a 
things get wild and comes and goes and wins the national championship in the tournament this wow. year, that I, that is when the real conversation That's happens. Right. Like, are we putting it one, two, or three? <laughs> I think it's, I mean, it's inevitably going to be stuck there at number four until this thing goes even deeper. You know, what's interesting though, like the, the major three sports, football, basketball, and baseball are the ones that we care about in the South, right? Yeah. In our area, Clemson fans will say they care about the soccer national championship, and there may be Clemson soccer fans who have a tie to the program. But other, you appreciate it because you got it. Yeah, but you're not you do. Really that's that right. Stoked on it. And you listen, if you're a casual fan, that's exactly right. You say, hey, yeah, we, that's great. You know, fantastic. But then you you can't name one soccer player. You can name a football player from the 2018 team, right? We all know who the quarterback was. We all know who the quarterback was in 2016. Clemson fans probably could name a lot more players on the 1981 championship team than they could the soccer team. I'm sure that's the case. I do think an elite eight berth. Probably a guy named Blaine or Tristan <laughs> or Shiloh or something no, like that. No, yeah. no. I do Why think do all soccer players have these frou frou names. I don't get it. <laughs> I do think the elite eight berth would be like right at four. I, I couldn't put the, the elite eight berth above any national title. However, I would put it above the soccer national title. Now, tell me, Texter, uh, Diesel, if you agree with me on that or not, if they were to punch their ticket to the Elite Eight tonight, I do think that is more impressive than a soccer national championship. And you may you may say, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard because you won two national titles in soccer, but basketball is a major sport, right? And the NCAA tournament's a major tournament. It, we all love March Madness. And making the Sweet 16 is nice. We've seen South Carolina do that in recent years. But when you get to the Elite Eight, man, you're, as you said, you're on the brink. Like, yeah. you're a couple of wins away from messing around and really, Sweet, you know. Sweet 16 is kind of on that line between good and great. That's right. Like, getting into the tournament, you've had a good season. Uh, yep. Like, a really good season. But a Cinderella can get to the Sweet 16. Yeah, then you've had a, then you've had a good, a great season. You make, it, you make it past that, you've had an elite season. But, but wouldn't you agree, like, Talking about the Cinderellas, and there's not really a big Cinderella this year. I would say a Cinderella kind of stops around this time. Sure. Either whether whether they win and keep advancing, because Most of the time, yes, because These great stories end in the Sweet Sixteen. Like you've you've messed around, you've won a couple of games that you weren't supposed to win. You find yourself there, and then okay, now you're there with the real elite teams. So while I would rank the Elite Eight as the top four, maybe top five, I wouldn't consider Clemson a Cinderella. I, I don't know that with their no, dominant mean, regular season, you can say they're a Cinderella. No, I mean, they won, tw what, 26 games this year, 27 games, 23 games this year. Uh, so that's good. That's that's a really good season in the ACC, um, but not dominant. They beat Alabama. Mm -hmm. They also beat North Carolina this year. So as you said, it was expected. They played good. Now they did taper off toward the end of the season. However, I wouldn't consider them a Cinderella. But going back to the original topic, I do think Brad Brownell, and it's crazy. It, you know, basketball is a weird sport. Things can change quick, man. Like, and football, you have to see Diesel, as you and I both love college football, like you'll see progression from coaches. You'll see, you know, a new coach come in, win six games. Next year, he maybe wins seven or eight. And then maybe third or fourth year, he, you know, he might be contending for the college football playoff. It usually takes a few years. But if you do get a coach like South Carolina got this year in Lamont Paris, or a guy who's been there forever in Brad Brownell, who everyone is ready to rid, right? Everyone's ready to get rid of Brad Brownell. How, what other sport can things change as quickly as college basketball? I mean, we're talking about like they lost in the ACC tournament a few weeks ago. And when they lost in the ACC tournament, everyone was saying, We thought they were cooked. If they lose again, he's gone. If they lose in the first round and get bounced by New Mexico, Brad today is already gone. Brad might be at the College of Charleston today replacing Pat Kelsey. Seriously. He is the absolute best at winning when he absolutely has to. So, like, that's my Every point. four years. It changes. College basketball is so unique in how quickly the, the the I guess, the ex, not expectations, but the, uh, you know, the way people look at your program. What I want to know from Clemson fans is after a season like this, let's just say it ends tonight. You've had a sweet 16 season. Yeah. If you advance and you make the elite eight, great. Either way, what are Clemson fans expectations going to be next year? I mean, are you going to maintain this high level of expectation? Regardless the, of what happens tonight, win a game, make the round of 32. That becomes the new expectation 
for Clemson basketball? Because I'm going to tell you right now, that's going to be difficult for Clemson to achieve next year with so many of their elite players, uh, Chase Hunter, uh, uh, P.J. Hall. Uh, uh, Most Joe likely P.J., yeah. All those guys are going to be gone after this season. So Clemson is going to have to essentially uh, rebuild from a new from a new set of stars. Ian Shefflin is going to be back, but he's not a guy who's putting up 30 points for you every single night. He's a great guy to keep around. You absolutely want to hold on to that guy. But the, 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 my, my question is for Clemson fans. Please text in at 71307. Start your text with keyword fan. Let me know, does a season like this, what you've achieved right now as of 332 mm-hmm. on a Thursday afternoon, is this enough to raise your expectation or are you going to slide back into, oh, okay, well, you know, he, he made the NIT. I guess that's good enough for me. I'm, I'll be honest that with you. Be the new basketball slogan for Clemson basketball. NIT is good enough for me. If I'm completely honest with you, Diesel, I think the majority of Clemson fans do not like Brad Brunell as the coach of their basketball team. So to answer your question, I think the majority of Clemson fans are probably sitting here today thinking, crap, we just got to the Sweet 16. We had a Clemson fan a few weeks ago tell us on these very airwaves that he wants to see Clemson lose so they can get rid of Brad Brownell. See what I'm saying? Yeah. I I, I really believe that. I really believe like Clemson fans will never say, oh, I hope we don't want a game in the Sweet 16 because everyone wants to get to the Elite Eight. But Sure you do. I think there's a a large contingency of Clemson fans who will admit if you got them by themselves, they'd they'd say, yeah, you know what? It probably is not the best thing that we're in the Sweet 16, especially if you lose tonight. Yeah. Right? Like if you win, it's a different story. You're one of the best eight teams in the country. But if you lose tonight, you're like, crap, what was all that for? Now we got Brad Brown out for four more years. Here's what's interesting about going into next season. Again, we talked about – you know, P.J. Hall, Chase Hunter, and Joe Girard all being gone, Ian, Sh- Ian Shefflin still being around. Uh, right right now, Brad Brunell is sitting with the number 22 class in America in twenty for 2024. He looks like he's got a very, very good class coming in. So could he add to that with maybe two elite transfers? He'd need to. He did it this year with one, with Joe Girard. He added that piece. I mean, could you imagine where Clemson would be? I mean, they'd be sitting at home right now watching on television just like everybody else. Without Joe Girard. From Syracuse, yeah. Yeah. Without, yeah. So, so is Clemson going to look at this? The university, the NIL donors, all those people, are they going to look at this and say, oh, I think we could turn this into a real uh, transfer portal destination. If if a transfer portal guy got us to the Sweet 16, what can we do with two transfer portal guys? Why don't we open up the purse, yeah. the purse strings and go get two? Tra- and that's how you keep this thing going. No, I agree. Sustainability really matters here. I mean, we look at what happened with South Carolina when they made their run a few years ago. The program fell off in a major way with Frank Martin in his last couple of seasons. And then now look at it. It's it's back on the upswing. If South Carolina can sustain what they did with a whole bunch of transfers, if they can do it again and again and again without Michi Johnson, we, we had that breaking news a few days ago that he entered the transfer portal. Right. Can Clemson do the same thing? Can they maintain their level of play and maintain and – and permanently increase the expectation at Clemson with another transfer portal class. So I think to answer your question, I think that's a great question. I think there's there has to be Diesel a good mix, right? I think you have to have a guy like a P.J. Hall, homegrown, right, that you recruit in, a solid recruiting class. I don't want to say a top-10 recruiting class, but you do have to have, like, the core there. And then when you can go at a guy – from the portal, as you said, or two. No, uh, it's it's a great way to mix guys from the portal as well as homegrown guys because that does give you a level of consistency that you can't get when you just rely on those homegrown guys. A streamer, uh, P. Digit, said Brad Brownell has been given more of a chance to succeed than any other head coach at Clemson. Ask Monty Lee. Don't give Brad a raise or an extension. Well, that I didn't. I hadn't got to this point, but I did have it written down as a note. Yeah, uh, what they've achieved right now, and even if they win, even if they make it into the Elite Eight, I'm not automatically extending Brad Brownell because we've seen this roller coaster ride. And he has how many uh, years Brad left? Brownell. He's got three years left on his deal. His deal runs through 2026, which we don't know for sure, but we assume this means the 2026-2027 season. Like I would, I would concede, and I've been very harsh on Brad Brownell. Mm-hmm. I would concede that Brad Brownell is probably safe through the end of his contract because of this current, year through his end of his current contract, but I'm not looking at an automatic extension 
if no if he wins tonight and gets into the elite eight. No, and, and listen, we could probably spend a whole other topic or hour on that. I agree because of what he's done this year. You're right. I agree. He's safe through his contract. However, if you're telling me he has two to three more years left, I don't think you even visit. We, we talk about this with NFL players. Uh, they're doing the same thing in the, NF, in the NFL right now, especially with Dak Prescott. When do you make that decision? If you're Clemson, I don't think you even – why rush? Why rush to make a decision on Brownell? If you're, going, if you're set, if you know in your head you're going to let him play out his contract, don't – you said it. Don't give him any more money. Don't give him an, uh, an extension yet. Let it play out because, as we hate to say this, the next two years he could fall flat on his face, and then you've already given him his, you know, an extension. You have to let it play out. Yeah, and, and they'll say things like, well, recruiting. They, you have to know if the coach is going to be around to recruit. Well, you got three years left, so that's not really going to be an issue. And, of course, with the transfer portal, you can bring in uh, anybody. All it takes is one really good yeah. portal guy to add to your team to a point that you become – uh, become a tournament quality team. So Cole, you and I have both talked about, you know, who we, what we think needs to happen in this game, but we haven't talked about a score prediction yet. We haven't really gotten into predictions for this game, keys to win the game, yeah. score predictions. We haven't really gotten into that. So I'd love to hear from you right Man. here, right now, three thirty-eight. time to make a call. You say Clemson's going to win this game. Do you have a score prediction? So what's interesting, like when you look at Arizona's schedule, they have lit it up. I mean, like at the end of the yeah. season, they put over <laughs> they put up over a hundred on Oregon. You saw how Oregon handled South Carolina. A team like USC and Southern Cal, they did beat Arizona at the end of the season. I don't know how much you put how much stock you put into that because it was right before the Pac-12 tournament. They turned around and beat them again the next like the next week by like 30, and then they lost to Oregon again. You know, they've been scoring a lot, 80 to 100 points a game, Diesel. They scored 78 against Dayton. I think they score in the 70s against Clemson. We do this in football a lot, the race to what? Uh -huh. Clemson's going to have to score the basketball tonight. I mean, yeah. they're going to have to. I know we talk about they don't need to rely on their threes, but guess what? You're going to have to. You're going to have to have three balls fall tonight. I say Clemson wins tonight 73 to 70. Ooh, 73 to That's interesting because you and I both land on the exact same score total for Clemson, but not for Arizona. No way. So to me, like both of these teams, whoever's going to win this game is going to be most effective at doing what they do, at being who they are. Yeah. Arizona's a run and gun, a lot of ball movement, a lot of uh, pressing the ball up the court, fast break kind of team. And if Arizona can achieve that, then they win this game relatively easily. Clemson, though, loves to slow things down. They, they do. love to play uh, hard-nosed defense. If they can do that, they have a chance to win this game. Uh, what's really going to be important tonight is what Clemson is able to do with Caleb Love. If that guy is on, like if he is if he is dropping him in the mm. bucket time after time, after, you're going to lose this game. Yeah, You're going to lose this game because Caleb Love, when he is on, he is one of the best at shooting the three ball. Now, if he uh, is off, I say just just play single man coverage on on him. Don't try to double team him too much. Don't try to try try to trap him too much because Caleb Love is a trigger happy shooter. He has that much confidence in himself. He will keep shooting even when he's not hitting shots. So if you can if you can, if he's you know having an off night tonight, you can play off him and play better defense on everybody else. Um, I like Clemson to cover the seven and a half, but obviously. I picked them to lose this game, so I've got Clemson 73, Arizona 80. I think they <laughs> I think they are able to hold Arizona to the low end of what they average or even below their average, but I'm not sure that they have the Clemson has the horses and the shooters to be able to score with them. They don't though. So that's why they're gonna have to rely on the defense. Clemson doesn't have the the, the shooters to hang with Arizona. They don't. And, and you know, as we've talked about the, the two wins so far, they have played fantastic defense and the only way they're going to win the night yeah they're going to have to get shots or hit shots yeah their guards are going to have to be really good not only offensively but defensively as you talked about diesel trying to slow down the guard play for arizona they're going to have to play stellar defense tonight and i think the x factor and we'll talk about this at four o'clock in just a few minutes with pj hall's high school basketball coach i think the x factor is pj hall and foul trouble It'll be interesting to see after the first two tournament games. He's gotten into foul trouble. I think that's my X factor tonight. It'll be very interesting to see his mentality, how he comes out tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun, though. It really will. 
Uh, you're listening to Wire to Wire on the Fan Upstate. I'm Diesel. He is Cole Bryce. And when we come back, we are watching an empire crumble right before our eyes. It's happening, and it's just really painful to see. We'll talk about that next here on the Fan Upstate. And Caro attacking again. And that's not bad defense, but it's a foul and a finish. And you just see the strength where you're not going to stop him. And a technical free throw. Draymond's got to be careful here. You already down Kaminga. Well, Steph got one T early. Steve just took a timeout. Yes. And you want to get away from Ray Acosta so this doesn't grow. You got multiple guys with the Warriors bench just coming over just to make sure Draymond doesn't go over the line here. You got to watch out. He's letting them hear it. The, the, the officials are kind of letting him speak and say his piece. He got another tag. He's out. gone. He just got ejected. With 824 remaining in the first, that's, that's a huge blow. In his type of game against this team, all the size they got. Steph was reacting to shaking his head after Draymond got thrown out. His team's playing for a playoff spot. Mm -hmm. 
They're fighting for a playoff spot, and Draymond Green is getting double teched and thrown out of games four minutes into the game. This is absolutely pathetic. <laughs> pathetic from Draymond Green. We were laughing. We were talking about uh, well, AJ Green and the podcast he was talking about. Yeah. On the way in, in the commercial, we're like, everybody's got a podcast. Draymond Green has a podcast. And his ego, you can see, since he started his podcast, Draymond Green's ego has just grown and grown and grown and grown since then. Four minutes into last night's game, which was a 101-93 win, by the way, for the Warriors over Orlando, Thanks, no thanks to, to uh, Draymond Green for achieving that, received two technical fouls, first at the 850 mark. He was called for a foul, and he disputed it. He got teed up for that. Then two possessions later, Steph Curry generated a stoppage and Draymond Green went after referee Ray Acosta again, not even about Steph Curry's infraction. He was just still arguing this foul. Like you're four minutes into the game, Draymond. Yeah. So like, what is going on in this guy's head? Has he got whatever Kanye's got where I, he's losing his mind in front of everybody? You know, Diesel, I know that there's a, a lot of people in our audience that don't watch NBA on a regular basis, and I get it. I am not one of those people. I have, I've always loved the NBA, so I, I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated by this, and I've always despised Draymond Green, and I've always despised Golden State. I, I really have. I can't you know, stand. I've been him. a Draymond apologist well, up until this season. Here's what I'd say: at this point, I think the media on the national media sets. I think they've done a horrific job throughout the last two to three years when it comes to Draymond Green. Because they've given him an out after out after out after out. Oh, well, look what he did for the organization. They don't win titles without Dre. Blah, blah, blah. They don't. That's bull crap, first of all. The second thing I'd say is this is Draymond Green. I don't even know why people are surprised about it. I saw it last night. They were talking about it at the halftime set of the game I was watching. And literally, I think my instant thought was, oh, I'm not surprised. You know, yeah. this is Draymond. He, he, he doesn't know how to control himself on the court. And look, I'm not going to sit here and say he has issues that he's dealing with. I don't know that. He may he may have issues that he's dealing with that's causing him, Diesel, to act like this. But at the end of the day, the bigger story is Golden State, the way they're built right now, they don't have the guys they used to have. They have to rely on Draymond. Kaminga was hurt last night. Draymond Green, the current state of the Warriors, they have to rely on him, and Curry knows that. And last night you saw Steph Curry, after the fact, how upset he was. It's because, number one, he's tired, I'm sure, of having to deal with this. And number two, he knows that their current team, the way it's constructed, they have to have Draymond on the floor because they're not very good. We're talking about them fighting for 10th in the West. Yeah. And, and to play in, it's 7 through 10. Houston is right on their heels. Houston is 37 and 25. Golden State's 38 and 24. That is one game that separates Houston and Golden State. And all of a sudden, the big story, in my opinion, to this is if that were to have slipped last night and Steph didn't save them and they lose and they miss the playoffs, this offseason diesel, the whole thing would have been blown up. Look, I, I'm all for enforcers in sports. I mean, like growing up when I was a kid, I loved watching the mighty ducks movies. It was Fulton, right. Reed, The enforcer. Everybody wanted to be that guy. You right? gotta have one big dude who's willing to jump in and scrap when he really, really has to. And earlier in his career before it seemed like he wanted to get ejected every night because that's part of his character. Uh, I like Draymond green in the way he played. He felt like a throwback type of, of player did. who plays hard, who, you know, it's okay if he gets in foul trouble because he's smart, and if he gets in trouble, he can figure out how to play around it for the rest of the game. But, like, this thing has gone through such a downward spiral over the past couple of seasons. I mean, we, we go back to 2022 when he punched his teammate Jordan Poole. Then we go back to 2023 when he stomped on DeMantis Sabonis. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's, been, he's been ejected four times this season, 21 times in his career. I mean, it seems like this is what he's trying to do. Like, again, we all love heels in sports. We all we love do. the hard-nosed players, but this is getting absurd. This is entering Dennis Rodman territory, not like early Dennis Rodman when he was great, when he was an elite rebounder. But this is entering the worm territory 
of Dennis Rodman? Like, are we waiting for Draymond Green to start painting leopard print on his head or something like that? Because that's that's who he's becoming. Maybe maybe we can send Draymond over to the Middle East to fix these problems, or maybe we can send him over to to Russia to get with Vladimir Putin and fix this thing. I mean, it worked for Rodman. Well, I'll tell you, Korea. That, that's a great point. I'll tell you this: what's in my opinion, what's different about the Rodman situation compared to what we're dealing with now? Diesel, if this were to Draymond Green. If this were to have been happening, let's say, eight, ten years ago, I don't think it would have been as a, a big as a deal as it is now. And with Rodman, what I think is similar is they're both – that personality is similar, but Rodman's team was in a completely different state yeah. than what Golden State's team's currently in. They like, were still at the tippy top. They were. And my point is, right now, if you were to have a, a big sheet of fabric diesel, it almost seems like, to me, the fabric has completely ripped, and there's two tiny little seams. Like, one is Curry, and the other little seam is Draymond and Clay somewhere in there between. And as soon as one of these rip, the fabric's gone, and this it, this dynasty is completely over. I really mean that. Do you do you believe a single word that Draymond said? This was a few months back. I remember this when Draymond said he had been ejected, and we were talking about you know suspension, long term suspension, and he said I was about to retire mid season, and then Adam Silver called me personally right. and and asked me, begged me, yeah, not to retire. Do you believe that? Do you believe that at all? I don't. <laughs> that's like, your why, question. Why does Adam Silver I, need Draymond Green? I don't think. I don't believe everything he says. I do believe that Adam Silver is the type of commissioner. I think Adam Silver is the best commissioner in sports. You mean, the, you mean the guy that crawls out of a coffin every night to go do his job? Yes, I do that think guy? I do think he cares about dynasties and like the health of the sport. Because at the end of the day, if this was a guy who was on the Toronto Raptors, it wouldn't be a really big deal. But this is Draymond Green. He's won the championships, the dynasty. As I said, it looks like it's about to collapse. It may be very, very soon. And because of that, you know, I think he does care. I think the NBA does care. But the question is for how much longer? Trey Davis on the stream says Draymond Green could face one of the Paul brothers, and it would be the first time I'd ever be cheering for a Paul brother. Facts. That's true. I mean, that's true. That's a fact. <laughs> Draymond Green is turning himself into a sideshow. He is. Right? He's turning himself into a sideshow. So, I mean, if if we saw – and I don't, I don't watch it because it's not a real sport. Uh, but if we saw Draymond Green come out uh, in, in a wrestling match or something like that, would you be surprised? Has he done this? I, I, I assume he has because he's that much of a heel. But I, have, I haven't witnessed it. <laughs> no, I do, uh, I do agree with you. But I just think at the end of the day, this thing's so close to being done. Like I think this thing's so close to being over, Diesel, that it's just anything right now, any loose screw. It, it, you can just see list. it, man. Yeah, he does. You can see it coming to an end. And uh, you know what? You were an apologist, and I think there were a lot of Draymond Green apologists, but I don't anymore. I don't think there are much or many Draymond Green apologists anymore. All right, coming up very in the very next segment, we will talk to P.J. Hall's high school basketball coach. We have had several interesting texts on the stream about P.J. Hall, whether we think he is the X Factor tonight. We'll talk to Thomas Ryan, the head coach of the Dorman Cavaliers, who coached P.J. Hall in high school next on Wire to Wire.
We hope that you turned it on at the very beginning of the show. We hope that you leave it on all the way until the end of the show. We're going wire to wire. We hope that you're coming with us each and every day here on Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson on the Fan Up State. We're broadcasting live here from the Ingalls Markets studios, and we are always accepting uh, your text messages at 71307. Start your text with keyword fan here in just a few minutes. We're going to bring on P.J. Hall's high school coach, the head coach of the Dorman Basketball Cavaliers, uh, Thomas Ryan. He's going to be joining us here in just a few minutes on the show. Uh, but tonight we have, man, just a, a solid slate of games, a really solid slate of basketball games. Clemson and Arizona kicking things off at uh, 709. See, here I am thinking football, kicking things mm, off, tipping, tipping things off. Tipping thing. We're gonna if we're gonna do our puns, we're gonna stay uh, with the correct sport. Seven oh nine, Clemson, Arizona. Seven thirty nine, San Diego State at UConn or versus UConn. Excuse me. Uh, seven uh, nine thirty nine, Alabama and North Carolina. Then ten oh nine, we'll have Illinois and Iowa State. Uh, most likely upset of these four. I'm going to say Alabama most likely to upset North Carolina. What do you say? Seven one three zero seven. Start your text with keyword fan of the four games tonight. Uh, which do you predict as the most likely upset based on seeding? You could also get in in the comments section on uh, the web stream, whether you're watching on Facebook, on YouTube, or on X. Coach, we are broadcasting rise. live on all three of Appreciate those right you. now. Drop your prediction in the comments section. We'd love to hear from you. And and uh, we are efforting now. Thomas Ryan, the uh, head coach we got of the him, man. Cavaliers. We have got him. He is ready to go. I tell you what, I sure do appreciate him making time uh, for us as I'm ex very, very excited uh, about this interview as Coach Thomas Ryan was P.J. Hall's high school basketball coach. If you're from the area, you probably knew that already. However, there are a lot of people who are uh, new to the area and may not have known that. But uh, we now bring in the head basketball coach of the Dorman Cavaliers, Coach Thomas Ryan. Coach, First of all, we appreciate you taking time to join us. How excited are you to see one of your former players have a chance to punch their ticket to the Elite Eight? Well, I'm really excited. Can't wait. Happy for PJ. I was texting him last night. He he's excited and pumped. And uh, what a what an incredible career the kids had. And then to come through here in in the in the tournament like he has and their team has is it, it, quite an accomplishment. I'm just really really proud of him. Thomas Ryan, head coach of Dorman Basketball. Now, uh, Thomas. PJ is not the only player that's come out of your program who's made uh, who's made a name for himself and has had one heck of a season. Miles Tate up at App State, he had himself a really great season as well up there. Uh, but we talked a lot you know, over the past couple of days about about PJ Hall's foul trouble in the last game there against Baylor. We saw the emotion coming out of, of PJ Hall. So uh, things change, people grow, people change over a couple of years, and it's been four years since you've coached. Uh, PJ Hall, but can you describe PJ as a player in high school? What was his emotional center like when he played for you? Well, I think it's similar. I mean, PJ plays with a lot of emotion. I mean, he's a high energy kid. He's competitive. You know, he wants to win. Sometimes his, you know, happy go lucky attitude maybe, um, you know, gets a little bit in the way, but I think it's what makes him good. So you kind of have to take the positive with the negative there. Obviously, him, him staying out of foul trouble is huge tonight. I mean, you can't even, you know, and it, and it has been for Clemson all year, and there's been struggles with that from P.J. I mean, even the other night, I thought for a long time he, he did well, but then had a, you know, got caught up in the air a couple of times where he probably just needed to, you know, keep his feet. And I think that's going to be a big problem with P.J. If somebody shows him that ball, you know, he goes for it. Leaves it. When you get up in the air, you have, you know, you're in trouble. They, 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 they control the scenario, and he's got a couple of tough fouls. Now, I'm also going to be honest with you, and this is the coach with the, you know, Dorman Cavalier glasses on. I, I think PJ also, if you look at the course year and just track every game, has not been the beneficiary of some 50 50 calls on both ends, offensively and defensively. And hopefully, in an NCAA tournament you know, game, Sweet 16 game, you, you have to feel like those officials are going to, uh, you know, let them play through it, let the guys decide on the floor. So I think that actually plays in PJ's advantage. Coach, when you look at the style of play that P.J. plays with, you're exactly right. He does play with a ton of emotion. But I wanted to ask you about a comment that Brad Brownell made after the game that I thought was very fascinating when talking about P.J. Hall. He said that he was way too hard on him throughout the game. Can you explain for our listeners out there what he really meant by that? Or I know obviously we can't put words into his mouth, but being a coach, when you say you're too hard on a kid, I would assume that you know what buttons to push and what buttons not to push, right, during the course of a game. What do you think he meant by that? 
Well, I think that's probably multifaceted there, okay? Coaching P.J. over a long haul, and you know, I was fortunate to coach P.J. for four or five years, three years on varsity, but he was in our program. I mean, his – you've already used the word happy-go-lucky attitude can sometimes, as a coach, you want to grit your teeth, and you almost want to just put your hands on him and say, P.J., so let's go, man. Like, you know, I've, I've told you this ten times. Um, and, and then, you know, so, so I think there's that part of it. And then, listen, let's be honest. Clemson's team, including Coach Brunell and PJ, have been under a ton of pressure the last 10 days, okay? Yeah. If not, two to three weeks. And really what I heard coming out of Coach Brunell's mouth is a little bit of that pressure after the, you know, the Boston College debacle in the ACC tournament, losing, I think, three or four coming in. I just think that their, their whole team, PJ, Coach Brunell, everybody was a little bit on edge. And I think as a coach, when you're on edge and as a player, you're on edge, you sometimes have some of those interactions. And, you know, I remember back to PJ's freshman year. Again, this is, you know, PJ's high school coach talking. I thought Brad was very, very tough on PJ and, and we weren't expecting more from him early. Their relationship's grown over these four years. I know Coach Brunell great and good friends with him. And it's been a, it's been a journey, and now they love each other. You know, not that they didn't like each other at the start, but it was a frustrating. You get a top 50 recruit, you want him to immediately impact. And as a freshman, P.J. was just a role player. And now, so I just think it's a culmination of a career together, trusting each other, loving each other, but then wanting it so bad, emotions run high. Coach, you said something there that I thought was interesting um, earlier when you started talking about P.J. and Brownell with the pressure. Do you feel like, obviously, I agree 100% with you, especially after that ACC tournament loss, there was a ton of pressure, and then you you beat New Mexico, maybe that takes a little bit of pressure off, and then you beat Baylor. Would you say now that the pressure's off Clemson and Brad Brownell and P.J. Hall, or do you still think there's some pressure there tonight? I don't. I honestly, I, I feel like that Clemson's team is really going to come out loose tonight, and obviously you've got the pressure of a Sweet 16. Now anybody feels that. I'd be surprised if this team doesn't come out about as loose as they could, coaches included. Uh, you know, I've just been very close to the program and kind of tracked, you know, everything that's going on. And it's been a, as good a year, as, especially how they started out, how they finished. Um, it's, been a, it's been a ton to deal with for that team because they are talented. They're really good. They've got a chance to – I feel like they've got as good a chance as anything to win tonight. I really do. I think it's a good matchup for them. Um, uh, especially if Chase Hunter plays well. I think he's kind of the key. When he plays well, Clemson is really, really tough. Um, and I would also expect P.J. to play a little better than he has in the first two rounds. I thought P.J., because of foul trouble, was just okay. Um, but I, I feel like this Clemson team and coaches comes into this really with the, everybody else has got pressure on them, not Clemson. Joined by uh, P.J. Hall's high school basketball coach, Thomas Ryan, head coach of the Dorman Cavaliers uh, let's go back to, uh, you know, PJ's mindset. You, you obviously spent an awful lot of time with him. Take us inside his head. Like what makes PJ Hall tick? You, you hear coaches say things like, uh, you, you have to figure out what makes each individual player tick, what motivates them. Some of them you have to get in their faces and you have to yell at them. Some of them you have to put your arm around them and tell them everything is going to be okay. Uh, so which, which one of those types of guys is PJ or is it situational? Well, I think it's situational. Good question. I think PJ Good responds question. both ways. I, I think you got to put your arm around him. He's got to know he can care about him. He loves him. And Coach Brunell and him have that that, that love relationship. Um, I felt that same way when PJ was at, was at Dorman. Um, but also, PJ can take the tough coach. And also, and this is where I give his family credit. You know, Jerome, Melanie, his sister Thayer. I mean, he comes from an athletic family that understands what it takes to win at a high level. So. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think any coach Brunell or myself or anybody coaches can take credit for him just growing up in a situation of, Hey, if you want to be great, this is what you do. This is how you handle coaching. This is how you respond. And then just having that competitive edge about you. Coach, when you look at PJ's game on the floor, I, I thought that was a great answer, by the way. But when you look at his game on the floor, especially tonight against a team like Arizona that really can get up and down the floor and score with the best of them, score over a hundred just a few weeks ago. Do you feel like tonight, and we're talking specifically about P.J. because we're talking to you and you coached him, do you feel like the three-point game has to be part of P.J.'s game tonight in order for Clemson to get to the Elite Eight? Uh, you know, I really do. I think that's a good point. I think all year long I've been saying, P.J., get in the paint, get down there, make a play <laughs> in the post. And I think most Clemson fans have said that. Said that. But I think tonight him stretching Arizona seven-footer, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Ballo or – you know, the big boy, the seven-footer, 
could be a matchup problem for PJ, and he may he may go on shuffling. I, I don't know how they'll play that. I don't know Arizona great, but I do think PJ stretching the floor tonight could be huge in this game if he can make two or three threes. Um, you know, I don't even know did he. I don't even think he shot one against Baylor. I he was zero for one. Zero for one. Okay, and so he really did get into the in the paint. Did what you know? Probably a lot of times we've been begging him to do all all year. But the bottom line is, even in high school, PJ's game is, hey, you know, inside and out. You know, and he knows that, you know, and tonight I really believe PJ needs to hit two or three threes for them to win and stretch that Arizona defense. Now I'm going to ask you a, a deep, dark question here, uh, Thomas. Thomas Ryan, head coach of Dorman Basketball. We spent a lot of time debating this on this show, and we know how much uh, PJ and his family uh, really love Brad Brownell. But in your mind, your mind, if, if Clemson loses this game tonight and they don't advance any farther, do you think Brad Brunell should be extended farther than he currently is? Or in your mind, do you think, you know, his time at Clemson is kind of coming to an end? No, I mean, listen, Sweet 16 finish. I mean, I, I think that his contract has to be extended. Um, you know, obviously the last two or three weeks has been, you know, you know, back and forth, but – uh, Brad's a great coach. He relates to his kids. He's really learned how to use the transfer portal in a way that's advantageous for Clemson. I think he'll continue to do that. I think the Sweet 16 run will give him even more opportunities in that transfer portal. And, and let's be honest. I mean, hey, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, you know, South Carolina this year, and we didn't mention we mentioned no Miles State, but Talon Cooper, who played point guard for us at Dorman, they win the most games in school history this year, but losing the first round, okay? And, and they, I thought they got a terrible matchup with Oregon. But, I mean, this Clemson team has made the Sweet 16, and that just can't be overlooked. Oh, yeah, that's big time at Clemson. Coach, before we let you go, one thing that I haven't asked that I did want to get to was something that we got a lot of reaction from earlier in the week after the Baylor game. And I know you watched that game, and I want you as a basketball guy who knows the X's and O's a lot better than we do, help me understand, like, when I was watching that game, it almost figured out against Baylor, it almost felt like, Coach, that at times Clemson was figuring out a way to win uh, behind the efforts of Hunter and play well without P.J., and then he comes on the floor late in that game, and to me it almost felt like that's kind of when Baylor crept back in. Is there anything to that in your opinion, or is that something that you just think was coincidence? I mean, I think it's coincidence. I think Chase Hunter was playing really, really well. Uh, you know, I, I think I think Baylor started kind of turning the screws of getting downhill, and the game kind of in that last six minutes kind of changed. I mean, P.J. had been out for a while. I don't know that I put a whole lot into that. You know, obviously I'd have loved to seen us just get when he went back in after foul trouble, get him down low and, and give him a touch and see what, uh, you know, see what he can do. At the same time, let's not forget this Clemson team. While I mean, PJ Hunter's an All American, uh, PJ Hall's an All American in my book. Uh, Chase Hunter, Gerard, uh, Shefflin. I mean, those guys are, are really big pieces, and I think they're pretty confident spreading that thing around. And you know, and and, and Godfrey was playing well. I, I just think that's what makes this this Clemson team now. Jack Clark is a defensive stopper. Seems a little deeper than people realize. Coach Thomas Ryan, head coach of Dorman Basketball, PJ Hall's high school basketball coach, joins us here on Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson on the Fan Upstate. Uh, one more question uh, here from me. Uh, I want to know about you and your program going forward, the Dorman U Cavaliers. Uh, how do you feel about your 2024 season, and who's going to be the next big name to come out of Dorman U? Yeah, I mean, we had a good season, went 21-8. and eight. Uh, We finished second in our region, a third-round playoffs, made it to the Elite Eight. And, you know, for, for our people and, and even for me, we've been spoiled a little bit over the last decade. Um, but a little disappointing, um, you know, you know, just been blessed to play in six state championships in the last previous eight years. And this year we just didn't quite have that. Christian Andrews had a great year for us, all-state player, still figuring out where he's going to play next year. Uh, but we're really looking forward to some young kids that we feel really good about. Hayden Brazil's brother Jalen is at USC Upstate. He, he, he was a sophomore starter for us at point guard. Um, you know, Will Bush, another sophomore that'll be a junior, six seven kid that we think is a college player. And so we're pretty excited about the future. Still a little bit young, but we have nine returners from last year after winning 21 games. And anytime you win 20 plus games in high school in a 26 game season, you're you're pleased. We just didn't make quite as deep a run. But pr proud of what we did this year, accomplished. We just didn't have, you know. Didn't necessarily have a PJ Hall or a Miles Tate or a Talon Cooper. <laughs> Sometimes you don't have that, it makes it a little tough. 
Coach, we appreciate it. Listen, today's opening day of baseball. I'm going to switch gears before I let you go. I'm going to ask Diesel, my co-host, this question in a little while. But if Thomas Ryan had to get on the rubber, tow the rubber from 60 feet, 6 inches, throwing out the first pitch, could we hit a strike? What are the odds of Thomas Ryan throwing a strike from 60 feet away? Well, I don't know. If I'm looking at Kim Mulkey, he thought he threw a strike and then got thrown out of the Savannah. I, I, I'll give Mulkey over Ryan right now, but I, I, I'm not going to kick dirt on the referee like uh, that. Like but uh, was that not something else? Unbelievable. Like, I, I, absolutely. I'm an athlete, man. I'd throw a strike in a heartbeat. <laughs> Coach, we appreciate it, man. Uh, enjoy the game tonight, and we uh, really appreciate it. Look forward to talking to you again real soon. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Appreciate y'all. Yes, sir. That's Thomas Ryan, the head basketball coach at Dorman. Uh, fantastic interview, Diesel. Really appreciate him jumping on. And, and man, that's a fantastic get by you. Well, I what appreciate it. Get. You know, I, I thought it was uh, very intriguing, the things that he said. I mean, uh, you asked a question about, you know, what makes PJ tick. And, and that was a very good interview from him um, in the way that he described how PJ plays. And, and, you know, I hate to say that it comes down to P.J. tonight, but when you talk about a guy who's your leading scorer, Diesel, right? We said it yesterday, but not only is he the leading scorer, he's also what? The guy on your team that has the most foul trouble. So that that is such an intriguing aspect of tonight's game. And, you know, to his point about P.J. having to shoot a little three ball tonight, yeah, that and, could make things interesting. And it's got to be tough for a guy who is foul prone, foul foul problem prone. Yeah, to be in and out, in and out, in and out, for again, sure. sitting for long periods of time, coming back into the game, getting a little bit rusty. I mean, you kind of cool off a little bit, and you're not quite playing as sharp as you were early in the game. That's going to be a really interesting thing to watch tonight as they take on the Arizona Wildcats. We are broadcasting live from the Ingles Market Studios here at uh, 25 Garlington Road in Greenville. Love to have your phone calls on the renewal by Anderson of the Carolinas fan phone line. That's 844-326-3663. When we come back, I will give you the precise date in 2024 that Clemson Ooh. will fall out of the top 25 in football. That is next on Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson.
It's Wire to Wire, Diesel and Cole Bryson. Let's go. Just a few hours away, less than three hours away from tip-off between Clemson and Arizona in the Sweet 16. I've got Clemson losing this game 80 oh. to 73. You've Diesel. got them winning the game 73 to 70. Now, we didn't talk about that. We did not. We, we, we did not collude at all, but we both landed on the exact same number for Clemson's point total. So that's interesting. I do have Clemson covering the seven and a half point spread, which is, in my opinion, a lot. Yeah, that's I think a that's a lot of points. But, you know, Arizona is a team that loves to score. They love to run and push the ball up the court. And they've got a lot of really, really good players. So it's going to be fascinating to see if Clemson's defense but, can slow them down. That's going to be the key. You know who they don't have? Arizona don't have Brad Brownell, baby. You oh said it. God. Who coaches better? In- <laughs> oh <laughs> you said it, God. Diesel. Who's a better coach when it matters? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep this thing down in Anderson. Excuse me, Pickens County. I didn't mean Anderson. Yeah, Pickens. Excuse me. To the you just offended to the fine residents of Pickens County. Clemson football going into 2024 is uh, rife, rife with question marks. They are all over the program going into 2024, and I want to look at the season game by game and and ask the question: If Clemson were to fall out of the top 25 in 2024. Precisely when do we think it's going to happen? Precisely when? I love this. Yeah. Can I ask a question, though, before we start? Where are we starting them at ranked? Uh, ESPN's way too early top 25 has them starting at 19. Okay, so they're in the 25 to start, and you're Correct. saying, once again, to reiterate, at what game, at what point do they drop out of the 25? If they're going to fall out, when is it going to happen? So uh, Clemson preseason starting 19th, coming off of a – Nine and four season in 2023, four and four in the ACC. We've started to see some of the cracks form, at least people's opinion, uh, and that sort of benefit of the doubt that Clemson has always gotten. I mean, they've always deserved it. They've deserved the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. But now some of that benefit of the doubt is starting to wear off. I agree. You know, we've got questions like, Cade Klubnik, is he the dude or is he not the dude? We saw him make some boneheaded decisions in 2023. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, tucking and running the ball when all he had to do was hand it off for an easy score. Mm-hmm. We well, have maybe. questions surrounding Dabo Sweeney. Is he losing his grip on exactly what it takes to win in the modern age of college football? Dabo Sweeney is going to do things his way no matter what. And maybe, maybe that way comes back around, comes full circle. Once we get through all of this chaos of NIL and the transfer portal. And I, and I, I messaged this to you last night. I heard Josh Pate say it on his show a few days ago. Yeah. He said that the chaos that we're going through now is the necessary pain to find the solution. Like, this is just nuts. We we talk about it with Virginia Tech basketball. They lost their entire starting five. Was that what you said? They did. Their App entire State starting five. Of their, excuse me. App State lost eight of their nine rotational players from a team that just won the conference last year. Two of them graduated. The other six entered the transfer portal. Mm-hmm. So this chaos is necessary to get us where we want to be. But the question is, uh, is Dabo Sweeney willing to do what it takes to win in this age of college football? We saw Nick Saban say multiple times, uh, is this really what you want college football to be? And it sounded like a dare. Is Nick Saban saying, hey, I'm going to do whatever it takes to win no matter what. Is this really the road that we want to go down in? So uh, in 2023, Clemson fell out of the top 25 in week three. It was quick. That was a very pre- quick precipitous drop. Mm-hmm. Yeah, bad loss. They were one and one at the time, zero and one in the ACC with that loss Duke. on the road at Duke. Uh, they fell to number one in others receiving votes, so effectively twenty six. That's as far as they fell last season. But prior to that, like I was talking about, with the benefit of the doubt, Clemson had been ranked every week since week fourteen of twenty twenty one. Yeah, so two and a half seasons straight of being ranked without ever falling out of the top twenty five. So I would say to answer your question, Diesel, and again, for those just joining us, Diesel's asking at what point will they drop out of the top 25 this year? I think my main question is if Georgia's one, does a loss to a number one Georgia knock you from 25 to 26 or more? So we're going to do this. We're going to go game by game through Clemson's schedule. 19, by the way. I I see – the back end of Clemson's schedule setting up very, very favorably for the Clemson Tigers. I do have them ending the season 
ranked. That's that's not a concern for me, okay? But the question is, if they fall out, when is it going to happen? We would love to hear from you on the text line, 71307. Start your text with keyword fan. If it happens, when is it going to happen? So August 31st, to kick off the season Ooh. at Mercedes-Benz Dome in Atlanta, a neutral site game, neutral site game versus Georgia. Georgia without Trevor Etienne. Don't know how much that's going to affect him. He's He's been... Uh, uh, he's been arrested for uh, DUI and a number of other things. Mm-hmm. I see. I, I still don't think Clemson has the horses to stay with Georgia, even without Trevor Etienne. I see that as a loss. So the question is, at 19, if they lose to Georgia, a team that is presumed to be extremely good next top year. Top three. I don't know that that knocks them all the way out of the top 25. Well, here's what it Especially depends on. if they can keep that game relatively close inside 14 points. I would agree, barring a catastrophic start for other top teams that are ranked in the top 25. What I mean is, if other teams around Clemson's area start losing as well, that might save them. It might save them. Yeah. But if everybody else wins, like I don't know that you could go from 19 to 26. Right. So you're saying, do they stay in the top 25? That means they'd have to go six spots. Yeah, I don't see him dropping six spots. now. Unless it's just an absolute bloodbath. Unless it's a 21-point differential. Yeah. That's the only way I see that happen. Week two, I, I, I see Clemson beating App State. I'm an App State grab, but I'm not that much of a homer that I would call the win mm. for App State. But I do think App State could stay with Clemson if they don't play their A game. After that, my my win, win loss, win loss, this is a whole lot of dubs. I see them beating NC State. Grayson McCall is there as a quarterback. Right. Uh, the rest of the offense is really, uh, really young, but they've got a really old seasoned defense. I still see Clemson winning this game. Yeah. A, a close game. NC State, I think, could give a lot of teams in the ACC a run. This Being season. at Clemson, though, I, yes. you know, I don't think that's where they drop out either. Yeah. Um, I, see, I see Stanford as a win. I see Florida State as a win. You do? Florida State will have a, will have a lot. This is at Florida State, by the way, October 5th. They'll have a lot of talent on the field, obviously, but. By week five, will they have it all figured out? I don't know, man. I don't know that that is. You're you're penciling that in as a question mark? If you're telling me this, if you're telling me that I have to pick a game for them to fall out of the top 25. mm, I think it's going to be after App State. I think it's going to be after App State. Yeah. If you lose to Georgia, you probably fall to 22-23. Or 25. If you have a subpar showing and app state keeps it close against you i see you know this benefit of the doubt that clemson has always gotten costing them and that's the week that i see clemson falling out after week two really that game is september 7th i don't know that they'll drop them though after a win though you think it happens yeah if you don't look good see the the pundits will always look at an app state as a team that's inferior to a clemson and I think a poor performance against App State will cost them. Well, let me ask you this though. Let's say let's say that they lose to Georgia, right? So they lose to Georgia. They go from 19 to 20. I agree with what you said, 23, 24, somewhere around in there. They beat App State. They they handle App State, which I think two to three touchdown game, whatever. NC State, that win against NC State, if they were to beat NC State, I feel like that would propel them again. And then you have Stanford. And Florida State, if you're telling me I have to pick a game where they could drop off, if they lose to Florida State, I think they're out of the top 25. But I'll go to your theory for a second. I'll go back to your theory. If they struggle with App State and they're borderline and then they struggle with NC State again, they could be out against NC State even if they do win. So you're in a similar line of thinking. You're just seven days back. I mean, yeah, it, I I really don't see Clemson starting the season 0-2. And as a matter of fact, you know, I see them starting a run with App State and winning out for the whole rest of the season. Some very, very close games. I think Louisville on November 2nd could be a really good game. I could see Florida at Florida State October 5th being a really good game. But I don't see Clemson losing to DJ Uyangalale in the Florida State Seminoles. No. I, just, I genuinely don't see that happening. Happening and you get almost all of your toughest opponents at home. I just know this, Diesel. Like if if you play App State and look halfway decent, and then you have a bye, and you come out again at Clemson, 
and don't look kind of like we saw last year early in the season. You don't look like everything's clicking. You kind of look like some of the gears are still rusty. And Cade Klubnik looks like the same Cade Klubnik we've always seen. Correct. We've seen the past how those NC State games, even at Clemson, can go, right? Yeah. Come down to a field goal. Yeah, that's true. So my point is you better – to answer your question, if you want to stay in the top 25, you better look good against NC State because if they're ranked in the top 25 – and you did beat Ab State late in the game, third or fourth quarter, and then you struggle with NC State. I don't know if you're telling me Clemson, after September 21st, struggled with the Wolfpack, didn't look the best against App State, and lost to Georgia. That's not a tw top 25 team. No, there's no way. Especially if you didn't look good against Georgia. If Georgia no. runs you out of the building, which is even without Trevor Etienne, still very possible, very plausible. For sure. I mean, this this thing could get ugly for the for the season. But then again, uh, I I do see Clemson winning most of these 50-50 games down the stretch. Or excuse me, all of these 50-50 games down the stretch. Uh, I see Clemson finishing the season eleven and one. So it's ultimately it's not going to hurt them. I see them finishing uh, inside the top 13, 14, certainly being in contention for that twelve team playoff. You know what's interesting though, like while Clemson's still in the ACC as of now. In years past, that Georgia game just like meant so much. I remember being there when it was a track meet uh, back in 2017, 2016, 2017. Clemson won. Next year, they got boat raced by Georgia. Uh, that that game meant a ton, and it still does. Like that game will still have a, a significant meaning, especially to answer your question about where they'll be in the top 25. But when you look at the season as a whole because of their strength of schedule, like you said, as long as that's the only slip up, you're still going to finish top 12 in my mind, right. And get in the, and get into the, the final playoff, which is, will be 12 teams. Um, but speaking top 25, that Georgia loss is going to be, is going to make things very, very interesting if they do in, indeed lose to Georgia. Now let's spin it this way. Let's pretend club Nick comes out and looks like, Trevor Lawrence. Like we all thought he was going to be. They beat Georgia. Yeah. Then the question is, do they ever drop out of the top 25? No. No. no I'd say there's no that, way. That win would sustain you through if you slipped up and you lost to, to Grayson McCall and NC State. If you slipped up and you – oh, God, man. Could you imagine the storylines in the upstate? <laughs> if they lose to DJ Uwe Anglele wearing – a Florida State Seminole helmet. Man, we would – oh, my God, could you imagine the next <laughs> Wednesday that we're on location with Melissa Level at Ingalls Markets? Ooh, I'd, I'd wow. call out sick. <laughs> Madcraft said – We just hand off the headset let her yeah. talk for four hours. Madcraft said, could you imagine a Dabo press conference being asked about losing to DJU? <laughs> That's a great point. Uh, oh, man. That'd um, be rough. Yeah, this is going to be a fascinating season for the Clemson Tigers. We find out, has Dabo – figured something out at quarterback or are we still uh questioning whether or not Cade Klubnik can get it done are we questioning if Christopher Vizina should step in and play midway through the season so answer your question if you had to put money on it right now does Clemson ever drop out of the top 25 I would say no okay but if it happens I think it'll happen after App State you would hope no but at the same time like I uh, I hear what you're saying, but if we see the say if we see the same Cade Klubnik diesel, the Georgia game will be a loss. Yeah. The NC State game will be hairy. The Stanford game could be a loss. Let's be honest. Like if, if Cade the throws, Florida State game could be a loss. If Cade throws a couple of picks, he makes a couple of bad decisions in that game. He fumbles the ball once or twice. The 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 writers and the pundits of college football will say, Oh, here we go. Same old Clemson. Where are, they're going to write them off. They're going to put them on the edge of writing them off after week one. If they lose to Georgia. If they lose to Georgia, yeah. And by the way, can we cool it with these neutral site games in Atlanta? That's, you don't think that's Georgia? neutral? These? No, hell no, it's not. <laughs> you got to drive past Athens to, to get, get to Atlanta. That's true. What the hell is going on? Let's get these games back on campus, please. I, I hate Sponsorship I money, baby. And neutral site games. Mercedes-Benz said no, 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 Diesel. No, no, yeah, no. Because there's so many people around here driving Mercedes in North Georgia and in, in upstate. Kirby South probably Carolina. is. A lot of Lexus. Kirby is. Here. Not, a lot of, not a lot of Mercedes. I think I saw Kirby's uh, Mercedes. That's good, Maybach. though. That's, that's good. You know I, I'm saying. 
I think that's a great conversation. I, I don't think they fall out, but if they do, I hate to say, say it. Say after week three. Yeah, I think so. I say after. Week and then three. for sure, if they were to drop it at I, Florida State, I right? I understand that I am homering it up a little bit and giving some extra credit to my. That's team. okay. That's okay. At you can do I that. Can admit it. I at least I admit if I'm going to homer it up, I'm going to admit it on the stage. But you can homer it as much as you want. Speaking of Homer, uh, the Atlanta Braves are not in action today, so I can't be much of a Homer today. I do, however, have three questions going into the MLB season. The Braves are off. They got postponed because of rain. But I'll ask three questions for Diesel and the audience next right here on Wire to Wire. It is opening day. Did you know that it was opening day? If you didn't, I feel sorry for you. You must live under a rock. You must not be a baseball fan. You must not be a Braves fan. If you're not, we hope that you uh, can be a Braves fan. We hope to turn you into a Braves fan because you are in Braves country, even though they're postponed. Speaking Diesel. of opening day, we've already got balls leaving the yards. Mike Trout hit the first home run mm. of the 2024 season on opening day. That must have been pretty early because that game had just started at like three. I think as soon as we came on the air, one started. 
Uh, the matinee game tonight's like the Dodgers. Of co- of course, not like the Dodgers. It is you know, of course, it's the Dodgers. If if uh, if they're going to cover a team, it's going to be the Dodgers on opening day or the Yankees. Speaking the Dodgers at home or away, Nick. They are. I believe they're at home. Oh, uh, nobody's going to have the balls to. Uh... To uh, heckle Shohei. I'm 99% sure they're at home. I'm not looking, but I think they are. But anyways, I have three questions um, for you, Diesel, and for our audience. There are several ways you can get in touch with the program. Text the show, 71307. Start your message with FAN. Phone lines are open as well, 844-326-3663. That's 844-326-3663. And you can also tweet the show. He's at Diesel on Radio. I am at the Cole Bryson. Uh, I am very intrigued by several things this season. As we are anticipating the Atlanta Braves to be very good, that is not my first question, Diesel. I want to know, and it actually it does have to do with the Braves a little bit, but I want to know, will we continue to see a trend where a trend of almost inconsistency? What I mean by that is ever since, I don't know, 2018, We haven't seen consistent number one seeds win the World Series. For example, in 2019, the Nationals won the World Series. They finished fourth. The Braves won it in 2021. They finished third. Last year, Diesel, the Rangers, who won the World Series, finished fifth in the AL. So my question is, will we continue to see this year Teams get knocked out early. One of the biggest frustrations that I've had as a Braves fan is over the last few years, and I know we just won a title, so you know I'm a little bit spoiled when I say this, but like last year, for example, the Braves were so good. They they had more home runs. They were the best team in baseball all year, Diesel. They were the best team by far in baseball. Mm -hmm. And then the postseason gets here, and then you have the layoff between the regular season and the postseason for number one seeds like the Braves, which I absolutely despise. And what we have learned is in the major leagues, the regular season after that layoff is absolutely voided. It's pointless. It means nothing. Because for the past two years, the Philadelphia Phillies have gotten hot, made a run. Last year, they almost made it to the World Series, got beat by the Diamondbacks. You very much don't want the buy. You, you don't. You don't. So that's my point. Will we continue to see top seeds who get the buy? Probably. The Dodgers knocked out early. Why are they able to dominate so well during the regular season? But all of a sudden, the postseason comes around, and there's no consistent trend of winning as the one seed. Because you don't have any meaningful baseball being played while you're on the buy. Remember last season, we were told, oh, the Braves are going to be fine. They've got this all-star team of, of prospects who are playing games against them. They're still playing baseball. Even though they're not out there, you know, even if they're even though they're not playing a, uh, an actual playoff, yep. game, well, these guys are still playing baseball, so it's going to keep them focused. It's going to keep. There's just something about not having your season on the line for a couple of days. You mean toward that, the end of the season? Towards the end of the season, yeah. I'm talking. I'm talking in that break once you've got the bye. Mm-hmm. It's just so long. First it's of a all, long time. I think it. I think baseball is a unique sport. Game time situation really matters, right? And even if so, if you're playing an exhibition. Even against elite guys who are major leaguers or or right below that AAA guys, it's just not the same. So I will say this: as bad as baseball is right now in terms of they have like no consistent identity of outreach to non baseball guy. Like baseball guy loves the MLB. Baseball guy loves pro baseball. But if you're not baseball guy, the MLB absolutely sucks at reaching. You know outside of baseball guy. Sure. I will say the good thing they have going is that there is parity because I don't think if you're trying to get someone involved with baseball diesel for the first time, I don't think one of the things you want to see is the same team winning over and over and over like the NBA or the Warriors or with the Cleveland Cavaliers or Alabama or Clemson. You've had parity. The Nationals won it in 19, Dodgers in 20, Braves in 21, Astros in 22, Rangers last year. That's five. That's six different teams you've had. You've had no uh, consistency. That's a tough one, man. Like, do, do people want to what, do dynasties attract new viewers? That's a great That's question. That's a great question. We need to go back. Five o'clock, to, uh, five o'clock fight one day. We yeah, put that in there. Yeah, we need to look at that. I mean, like when the Warriors went on their run, yeah. the Warriors were everywhere. Right. Everywhere. You could not turn on any television show, any advertisement without seeing something about You're the right. Warriors. So they certainly attract, like people say, oh, 
that Warriors, they were that team that was that was good last year, right? Oh, they won it again. Wow, I need to watch how good this team is. Five times in a row now. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 always really hard to get new customers in any business. So, I mean, you as a business owner, you understand that getting the new customer is the hardest part. Um, so yeah, it's a great question. It is, and, and I will be interested to see if we have it again uh this year. The Rangers were the the last team I expected to win it last year. I was in Texas the year before that. I was at the Rangers games. I saw that stadium absolutely empty. I mean, empty. The Rangers sucked in 2021. Absolutely terrible. 2022, Bruce Bochy gets there, and what do they do? They win it in his first year. Um, so that'll be my number one question is, do we see a consistent trend? Do we ever start to see some Blue Bloods start winning at the top in the MLB? Before I ask the second question, the texts are, by the way, I, I can't say that I, I I love anything more than the teams. Most of the teams, like especially the Yankees, uh -huh. who outspend everybody, just falling on their faces. And the Dodgers, you got to feel good. Yes, about I love it. You got to feel good. Braves fans love it, right? Yeah, but the, but the the Dodgers have fallen or have, have still made deep postseason runs, and the Yankees just aren't even getting there anymore. They're not. Uh, Texter says the Braves have always been a very good regular season team, but for some reason, come playoffs, they just can't win two World Series with like thirty division titles, which is true. They just Listen, they won it two years ago. Don't 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 act too spoiled, okay? 2021, three years ago now, the Braves won a championship. So I hear you. I hear you. I really do. My second question, I have three MLB opening day questions. That was my first. My second question, Diesel, is when it comes to the Braves, we'll park on the Braves for a second. I think the most consistent part of this team needs to be the bullpen. And when I say consistent, I really mean healthy. How healthy? Number two, how healthy does the Braves' bullpen have to stay in order for this team to do exactly what I just talked about in point number one? Come October, when it matters, the Braves need to have their starting five ready to go. If the Braves' bullpen can stay healthy during the season, take a little bit of load off the starters because I think the Braves have the best bullpen. I know they have one of the best starting five in baseball, but their bullpen is just nasty. So if they can, if they can stay healthy, with guys like Dylan Lee and A.J. Minner. And uh, now Chris Sale, obviously, he'll be a starter, but you have a, a bullpen with Chavez back in the Braves organization. You have a bullpen that's very deep. I think my number two question really comes from the fact of, okay, if October baseball matters, the Braves' bullpen needs to be the healthiest unit of the team during the season so that Diesel, the, the starting five, they don't have to have as much pressure and reps and throws during the season. Yeah. I mean, you're going to have to take uh, a lot of pressure, as much pressure and time and reps and throws as you can off of Chris sales. Uh, shoulders. <laughs> I mean, that guy, he, he you, you breathe on him the wrong way and he's out uh, for, a, for a big chunk of the season. You know, you got a guy uh, there in him who, who is a solid, uh, not, not solid, but can be an elite pitcher for you. Yeah. The question is just how long can you keep him healthy? And if you can keep him healthy all season long, you know, if you can on days when Chris Sale rotates into the into the starting job, pull him. If you can pull him by pull him. by the third or the fourth, pull then him. Then you can then you can keep him as healthy as you as long as you can. You get that guy into the postseason healthy, man. That that that's when this rotation gets really really nasty. And that's my point, Diesel. And you said it. You, you pull him and in hopes that guys like AJ Minner and Tyler Matzik and Dylan Dodd, who in my opinion looked really good at times last year. Uh, and A.J. smith Shaver, those guys can come in, do their job. So my point is the health of the bullpen is going to be, in my opinion, the most critical, critical when it comes to each unit of this team because when it matters, in October, the Atlanta Braves have to have that starting five ready and they have to have that starting five healthy. A starter that's going to be really interesting for me to watch is going to be uh, Ronaldo Lopez. He's moved yeah. up to the uh, – excuse me, well, basically – uh, fifth in the rotation, he's got a he's got an ERA that's right there on par with Spencer Strider. Now he hasn't been asked. He's been asked. He's been a bullpen guy for a lot of his career. For sure. Uh, but if he can do it as a starter, he's got a really strong uh, ERA. He's right there with Charlie Morton as well. Yeah. No, I, I think that was the last. Excuse me. That was the last pitcher they added. Yeah. I think there were a lot of question marks from Braves fans because of what you said. He did come from the bullpen, but. If he can give you five innings, my point is with this Braves bullpen, yeah, they've got to stay healthy. They've got to stay healthy, and it all correlates the bullpen and the starting five. I'm so excited about it, but again, I just I want I want the Braves to be good when it matters in October, not 
uh, first, you know, one in barbecue like they were last year. So my first question was, will we still continue to see uh, top teams knocked out early? My second question is the how healthy does the Braves bullpen have to stay in order to limit the reps from the starting five? My third question for MLB opening day, Diesel, and I'm really interested to hear what you say about this because you and I heard Dave Roberts before the show talk about it. Will the Otani scandal be enough to derail the Dodgers? Well, we talked about the other day, do we think this scandal is over? You thought yes, I say no. Um, the, the, the question is, how good are they at insulating Shohei Otani? I mean, he's a nice guy. You, you, you really want to, as a, as a person, you want to root for that kind of guy. Like, he seems like a great story, maybe naive with his money. Uh, I, I think they'll do enough to, to insulate him, and he will still be uh, the Shohei that we expect. I, I, think, I think the Dodgers will be fine. Are they a postseason team? Absolutely. And then once you get into the postseason, man, all bets are off. But the whole the whole point of the regular season is to get into the postseason. So you don't think it'll be enough to derail them? I don't. Th- I don't think it'll it'll like you know we're we're gonna look at this team come uh, come August, yeah. September, and say wow, what happened to the Dodgers? For they, sure, he's got too much talent across the board. So even if he does drop off a little bit this season, they're gonna have enough to prop him up. I completely agree. They should with their stacked roster. Uh, Mookie will probably win NL MVP since he didn't last year. Him and Acuna were right there, neck and neck all the way to the end. They've got MVPs. They've got all-stars up and down their lineup. So, no, I agree. I don't think it'll be enough to derail them. And I, I would I would love to see it, by the way, <laughs> as we talked about as a Braves fan. We'd all love to see uh, it derail them. But at the end of the day, I just think they're too stacked. They're too good. You're listening to Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryce in a brand new show here on Afternoon Drive on the Fan Upstate. Love to hear your thoughts on anything we're talking about on this show. 71307 is the text line. Start your text with keyword fan. When we come back, Cole and I put our dukes up. It's time for the 5 o'clock fight.
Do we have to start talking? Can we just listen to this intro play? No, we don't have That's to. Awesome. We don't have to do anything. We can do whatever you want, Diesel. It's your world. We're just living in it. It's a great listen. Listen, listen. It's great. It, it is wonderful. Our production team does a fantastic job. They really do. Especially, I'll tell you what else I love that they did. The five o'clock fight, man. If you didn't hear it yesterday, oh, it was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. Hats off to everyone who had a part in that. I absolutely love the intro and uh, the different rounds. And you know what? It makes it it makes it intense, Diesel, because you and I are both intense kind of people, especially when you're wrong, like you are on all three of these today. Well, I was right on three out of three yesterday. No, but, but, no, uh, yeah, Melissa, Melissa chickened out, wouldn't give me three out of three. Ah. Uh, no, man, the, the our production team here is fantastic. Fantastic. We can literally dream up something in the morning, send them over a script, and they'll have production made for it by by two o'clock in the afternoon. The best production. You'll hear on Afternoon Radio right here. It's an all-out slug fest, and nobody's leaving unscathed. Three topics, one winner. It's the 5 o'clock fight on Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson on The Fan Upstate. It is the 5 o'clock fight. Diesel, myself, Cole Bryson, we go at it each and every day at 5 o'clock, and we want you to be a part of the conversation. You be the judge. Diesel will tell you how to do that a little bit later on in the segment. But before we get there, Diesel, I want to let people know. The best way to get in touch with the show, 71307. Start your message with FAN. You can also call into the program when the phone lines are open, 844-FAN-PHONE. That is also – that also translates – uh, to 844 326 3663 if you don't know the numbers. Some of you aren't old enough to remember the I, I'm, nine text. I'm not shows. either. 844 326 3663 is the way you can get involved. And it is time, Diesel, to get this fight started. The ACC, they are still, Diesel, my friend, the best conference in college basketball you say i say no of course they're not and as a matter of fact i've got guys like hubert davis saying things like i don't need to prove anything you know who says that losers losers say we don't have to prove anything here's hubert well, i don't think we're in a position where we have to prove anything I, i've always felt like the acc was um arguably the best uh, conference in college basketball um yeah. Reason why that I believe that is for most of my life, I've been a part of this conference as a player, um, as an assistant coach for nine years, and now three as a head coach. And just, you know, the, the, the type of coaches and the programs and the consistency um, in the NCAA tournament from uh, this conference is proof on um, the quality of teams and programs that we have in this conference. He just said, I've spent my entire career in this conference, which means he's stuck in the bubble. <laughs> he's, he's, like, he's got his blinders on. He doesn't know anything else that's going on out there. So let's look at it. Let's look at it like this, Cole. Uh, the ACC is not the best oh, conference come in on. college basketball. And I look at it based on the seeding of the NCAA tournament. So what I've done as I've looked at the one, two, three, and four seeds, the only seeds that get any actual national respect, right? Dang, uh, you went I've, there. And I've assigned point values based on if you if a conference has a team in the first, second, third, or fourth uh, seeding positions. So you get you get one point for being a four seed, you get two points for being a three seed, three points for being a two seed, four points for being a one seed. Uh, for the one seeds are Big East, ACC, Big 12, and Big 10. Two seeds, Big 12, Pac-12, Big East, SEC. Three seeds, mm -hmm. Big Ten, Big 12, SEC, Big East. Four seeds, SEC, SEC, ACC, and Big 12. And based on my proprietary point system, the best conference in college basketball is the Big 12 with 10 points. The second best conference in college basketball is the Big East wow. with nine points. The third best is the SEC with seven points. And the ACC Rounded out the top oh, five come on. with five points. Diesel, you're ACC, wrong. based on the seedings, are the fifth best conference in basketball. 
Based on the seedings, throw the seedings in the trash. There's how many? Not one, not two, not three, four ACC teams left. That's right. North Carolina, North Carolina State, Clemson, and Duke. ACC is still. You throw NC they're State still the best. Talking the whole tournament, they don't belong. They're here. still the best conference, Diesel. You're wrong. The ACC is proving itself. They'll still be the best conference going forward in college basketball. I hate to tell you, but you're wrong. All right, it is time now for round two. Round two. Here we go, Diesel. The second time that you're going to be wrong today. One thing that I just do not like are electric vehicles. What are you going to do when you're stranded at a gas station and there's nowhere to plug in your electric vehicle? Can you please agree with me that electric vehicles are 100% out of line? You don't need to own an electric vehicle. If you own an electric vehicle, you're going to have the world's worst nightmare happen. It's just a matter of time. I do not like electric vehicles. Please agree. So, no, electric cars are what at this point? Like, legitimately, okay? A legitimate full electric cars are what? Like, five years old? Six years old? Do you really think the internal combustion engine was as good as it is right now? Five years after they invented the thing? Look, you're judging this technology. In its infancy, I'm judging it on what it can be one day. Like we still talk about how damned inefficient the internal combustion engine is. Uh, somebody out there who knows cars can can tell me. I think it's something like 23 percent efficiency oh. out of it. Only 23 percent of the fuel that you burn actually propels the car, or whatever that actually means. Look, electric cars right now they are wussy and weak, right? Like a Prius sucks it's a it's a lame car but i'm picturing what an electric car can be in the future you give this it can be broken down because there's no freaking charger or battery <laughs> that's what it can be I, right now it sucks to charge this thing it takes hours to charge this thing that's one thing that, that uh, the icu ha ice has on it is you can go fill that thing back up in five minutes and be back on the road but I'm telling you, man, you give this thing 100 years of development like the internal combustion engine has, electric cars are going to be awesome. Awesome. Like imagine these big old trucks with full access to its throttle. The moment you touch the gas pedal, that's going to be great. Wrong. Wrong. You're wrong. Wrong. <laughs> Wait, I do the Donald impersonations <laughs> around here, sir. You're wrong. All right. It's time now for... This one, I cannot say without smiling because this is Diesel's favorite topic ever. <laughs> favorite topic ever. Round three, the final round. I'm going to win all three. I'm going to go 3-0 and with a win tonight. I say Brad Brownell should get three to five more years of no criticism oh. from Clemson fans oh. until the time is up from his extension. You make it to the Elite Eight. You get three to five more years. I don't want to hear anything else, Mr. Diesel. So one great season where you beat North Carolina, you had a decent run in the NCAA tournament, and you're tacking another five years on this guy's career? I said three to five. <laughs> three to five years on this guy's career with no criticism. See, that's, where we, that's why we end up in these positions. You got fans on message boards saying, how dare you? Who do you think you are? <laughs> Like, dude, we're all here to discuss these things. We're all here to parse these words. But but a win tonight only gets Brad Brownell, in my mind, through his current contract. There is no guaranteed extension for this. Look, he, it's not like next year is his contract year where you got to look at this and say, okay, recruits aren't going to come here if we're not committed to our coach. No, he still you still got a couple of seasons left with Brad Brownell. You win tonight, you let him you let him play it out, and you see what happens. You know why? Because Brad Brownell has managed to overachieve in the year that it really, really matters. And next year he could be going down the cliff, like Wiley coyote smacking against the ground. Look, I don't trust uh, his, his year to year consistency. That has been the big time bugaboo for Brad Brownell. And so you can't let the shiny object, the jingling of the keys mm. distract you 
from what has been a guy who's up and down and up and down. I'm not taking anything away from his season. It's fantastic what they've done. It's fantastic the run that they've gone on in the NCAA tournament. But I'm not stupid enough to give this guy an extension because he had one great tournament run when it really mattered. Diesel, you get to the Elite Eight. You know how many coaches are in the Elite Eight? This is very basic math. Eight. Eight coaches. Do you know how many coaches are in college basketball? A lot freaking more than eight. Do you know how many coaches hit a shot to get their team there? Zero. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> but you said it, man. When the pressure's on, big Brad, big bad Brad, big bad. <laughs> he somehow, Diesel, finds a way to figure this thing out. The question is, who won the fight you have to tell us on the text line 71307 start your text with keyword fan or you could jump in on the stream whether you're on facebook on youtube or on x we want to know who won today's five o'clock fight what do you want diesel and co Bryson to fight about next if you've got an ass i'll kick it submit your topics to diesel at the fan upstate.com subject line fight on the fan upstate and that means we want you to tell us what you want us to fight about next on the five o'clock fight, anything goes. We will fight about anything. I think Mongo wants to fight me right now over is that my right? stance that wrestling is not an actual sport. Mongo, you've been, been spouting this nonstop every single time we bring this up. So we already have it's two so, ideas today. It's so easy to get your goat, Mondo, Mongo. Mongo, to write so these down. Easy to ruffle your feathers. Is wrestling a real sport? He says, not a real sport. I'll personally pay the mat fee for either of you to come to training Tuesday or Thursday night and see if it's a real sport or not. Mongo, I never said that wrestling wasn't difficult. I never said that wrestling wasn't physical. I never said that wrestling wasn't demanding. I'm just saying it's not a sport. It's not a sport. The difference in a sport and not a sport to me is defense. And there's no defense. When it's already planned out who's going to win this thing, all you got to do is run around, throw each other over uh, throw each other over your shoulder, pull your punches, not actually hit each other, and then, boom, somebody goes on the mat and doesn't get up this time. That's not a sport. So you've got it written down. You've got it written down for us to uh, revisit that topic because I do think it's very intriguing. But as Diesel said, you, the listener, you decide who wins. We're already getting a ton of of text messages and uh, input from you. We need those on the stream to let us know who won what round. I do see the first texter says the round one goes to Diesel. Yes. The next texter, he said Cole wins round one. I thought the SEC was better, but only the postseason matters, and the ACC still has their teams alive. Also, a texter says Cole wins round two. There's a movie about this with Vince Vaughn and Kevin James. They're trying to create an electric car, electric muscle car, but it never will happen. Another texter says fight uh, round one, Cole, round two, Cole, round three, Diesel. That's from Nathan. We appreciate you including your name. Round one and two, Diesel. Cole saved his worst take for last, says a texter. I very much appreciate that. Diesel wins round three because unless he wins the championship, there is no way he needs to be extended. That is a stupid statement, Texter. He's good until 2026. I say he is prove it status. Those of you uh, throw poo-pooing on all electric cars, have you seen the all electric Dodge Challenger? This thing is badass. I'm going to turn it around and show the camera here for anybody not watching at home. You're not seeing this. Look how badass that thing looks. Does it look as nice when it's on the side of the road <laughs> on dead battery? <laughs> and you're asking the guy with a, hey, man, what are you driving? Yeah, yeah, you're asking the guy with a real motor to give you a lift. To Do you know where the ne nearest electric station is, sir? Do you have any idea? Can we can we pull up a map of the nearest uh, charging station? 550 brake horsepower on this bad boy. Man, that just that just gets me moving. Say that again. Downstairs nether region, 550 horsepower. Zero horsepower when it's <laughs> dead battery. Look, again, <laughs> we all know that internal combustion engines are awful, awful in efficiency. And internal uh, and uh, uh, battery technology is only going to get better and better. So uh, we're having a little bit of mix reaction. Another texter says, Cole 2 to 1 winner. 
I appreciate that. Diesel uh, had Melissa, you know, he buttered her up yesterday and uh, she, she said that Diesel was the winner yesterday. So uh, I think I'm due Diesel, but I listen, I think it's a great conversation on Brownell. At the end of the day, your job is to do what? Your job is to win games. And has he won consistently? No. And I'm on record saying just a few days ago that if Clemson was going to get rid of him, Diesel, it should have been when? Last year. Last year. Well, They've how already. Do you know that next year is not going to be just like last year. Well, it could be. The only problem with that is <laughs> statistics in the past have shown. That more more likely than not, next year will be just like last. And it year. could be, but the problem is this year he may have be in the elite eight, <laughs> and you can't fire a coach who's in the elite eight. Uh, I don't well, have to fire him; I just don't have to extend him. Let his time run out, huh? Yep. Let the clock run out on old Big Brad Brownell. That's what we're gonna Big do. Brad. Big, Big Brad. Big bad Brad Brownell. <laughs> Coming up next on Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson, the newest show on Afternoon Drive here on the Fan Upstate. We need your participation yet again. We need you to tell us what is your town got that no other town in the Upstate has got. Huh? We're going to give you a chance to pimp your city. We're also going to give you a chance. Well, let's be real. We know what you're going to do. You're going to throw shade at the other cities yes. in the Upstate. So, what is your town got that no other town in the Upstate has got? Now would be the time. To hit us up at 71307 on the text line, text in uh, starting with the keyword fan. We'll be right back here to the Ingalls Market Studios to talk about this next on the Fan Upstate.
South Carolina is exploding in popularity and in population. Is Something it? that most of you remind us every single day is a terrible thing. Like, here's, here's the thing. We've made the upstate of South Carolina such a great place to live and work that the secret is out there. People know about it. People want to move here. As a matter of fact, South Carolina is one of the fastest growing states in the country I've seen since, that. since the pandemic. Some statistics indicate that about 35,000 people a year move to South Carolina. You can tell that when you're driving down the road, especially a road that you've taken to work all your life. Yeah. And there's a place where there used to be a bunch of woods. Now there's a housing development. Tell me about it. Yeah, they're everywhere. And we all know, we all know that the state of South Carolina is not keeping up with the infrastructure. It's not widening roads. It's not fixing roads. We know this is a big old problem. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about what makes your towns great. Okay. I want to talk about what makes your town great. As a matter of fact, maybe we could all learn something here and give each other reasons to get out of our little shells, our little bubbles, and drive around the upstate and see what there is to see, right? All right, let's do it. So I want to find out from you, 71307. Start your text with keyword fan, or you can call in on the renewal by Anderson of the Carolinas fan phone line. That's 844-326-3663. What does your town have that no other in the no other town in the upstate has? This is your opportunity to pimp your city. To pimp your town. Diesel, I will say this, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, our listeners are already getting in on the conversation, but I will add a little spice to this. I will allow the listeners to try to guess mine by giving you one hint very early in the segment. Hmm. What does your town have? Well, mine has one road, and everything in the town is on the one road. And if you want something, it's all on one road. And there's nothing else anywhere else other than the one road. That sounds like Woodruff Road. No. You're talking about. Feels Negative. Like, it feels like everything. It's becoming Woodruff, Woodruff road. road. It's becoming. So I will allow that to be a little bit of a teaser. That's crazy. When I first moved down here, actually, when I was a kid, yeah. listening, I could listen to upstate radio from where I lived. I lived in North Carolina. Huh? Uh-huh. Uh, Hickory. Is it mm-hmm. Hickory? Yeah. Home of John Reap. You know that guy? The, the Dodge I commercials. That thing got a Hemi in it. Oh yeah, now yeah, now yeah. Guy. Okay, gotcha. Uh, I think he also uh, he he played a redneck who had a one-eyed kid, a cyclops kid in one of the Harold and Kumar movies. <laughs> um, yeah, he's from my hometown. Okay, he, he might be he might be the only famous guy. Oh, Dale Jarrett is from my hometown. I actually looked this up one time and I tried to figure out, like, where do I rank in the most famous people from my hometown? And this is a of course this is a very self-serving. Uh, no, no, nah, not at all. <laughs> Where do I, I rank? Like, yeah, but I was like, <laughs> who is from my hometown? Like, legitimately, where yeah. do I rank in the most famous people in my hometown? And even before, you know, you and I ascended to hosts on Afternoon Drive on the Fan Upstate on our brand new show, Wire to Wire, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I truly believe, I feel, so, I feel so lame saying this, I truly believe I fall in the top 15 really? of most famous people in my wow. hometown. Wow. They must not yeah. have anybody. No, there's, there's John Reap. <laughs> uh, Rick Barnes is from my hometown. My dad went to high school with Rick Barnes, head coach at Tennessee, uh, yeah. head coach at uh, Texas and Clemson. Clemson. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's been a handful of other dudes. Dale Jarrett is from my hometown, NASCAR driver. Uh, we do have Hickory Motor Speedway, it's birthplace of the NASCAR stars. And a baseball it's, team. It's painted right there on the wall. Uh, yeah, we got the Hickory Crawdads, which, again, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here, but the Hickory Crawdads changed their name temporarily last season to the Hickory Dickory Dock, uh-huh. and I thought that was way better. Way better. Like, uniforms, they look like a grandfather clock. They had mice. It was great. It was great. But I, I digress. I digress. So the question is, what has your town got that no other town in the upstate uh, has? Let's see here. Uh, let's see. Mad Craft says zero car washes. Your town's got zero car washes. I'm not sure that that's something you'd really want to brag about. Uh, he also says that me Googling myself to see how famous I am is a very egotistical question to ask. Uh, but anyway, let's get back to the real question at hand here. Keith in TR says his town has real peace and quiet. Do you agree? Do you agree that the TR and I love TR? I really do. Are I we on the text line here? You're, yeah, you're reading my town has text line. 
Uh, peace and quiet. I would say for the most part, I would agree with that. Now, that one stretch was at Main Street right there through TR. Uh-huh. That's that's insanity. That's insanity. Are you talking things. about the road that goes out of TR? No, the one that goes into oh, TR. Not, like not downtown? 25, oh, okay. Not 25. not 25. I think 25 is more insanity than downtown sometimes. So. It right. just depends. But I, I do like TR. It is, for now, it is peaceful and quiet. It is. And it, but now, it's growing, but people, man. It's out. growing. People, it is. People know. People know. Um, but this one's really interesting to me. This I, I, I Texter, I've literally never heard of this. And I'm going to need somebody who, who grew up in Gaffney to let us know if this is true or not. Because I, oh, wow. I, I don't know that I believe you, Texter. All right. Texter says Gaffney used to have Vendamoos. They were like ATMs, but for milk. <laughs> A local milk company, Peeler's Dairy, ran the machines and then and had them throughout Cherokee County. Everybody bought their milk from the Vendamoo. And it even mooed come this is where this is where I don't buy it, Texter. It says it even <laughs> mooed like a cow when the milk came out. What did you do, Texter? Did you put your your bottle under like an udder and you squeezed on it a little bit and your milk came out? You don't think he's telling the truth? I don't there's no way. That's so silly. That's if it's true, that's amazing. Anybody, <laughs> anybody who lives in Cherokee County, and and nobody's guessed your hometown yet. They have not. But is your town in Cherokee County? Mine? Yeah. Negative. What county is that? Spartanburg. That's Spartanburg yeah. County? Okay. I didn't know if that was Cherokee or Spartanburg. Nope. Um, Venda Moose. Are they, that, there's no way that's real. You know, like, I expect you to I've say never that. seen one, but I'm young. In Gaffney. What are you, like, 27? Bingo. Oh, wow. Okay. Guessed I got it. you by 12 years. I feel old now. We got a caller coming in. But yeah. anyways, real quick, to your point, nobody's guessed mine yet. I said there was in my hometown, there's one road. Yep. People should know it. I Everything's know on that. Yeah. Everything's on one road, yep. and that's it. If you go off that road, there's nothing. That's as far as food and convenience, so right? Like how many of these Vendamoos were they? Were they like at, at every every water, water. grocery store? Were they were they planted outside grocery stores? Were they planted at gas stations? Because that sounds sketchy AF, man. What's the Getting name? your What's milk. What's the name? From a gas station milk dispenser. Uh, let's see here. Scotty from BMW says, true story about the Vendamoo. I lived in Gaffney for nearly 40 years. Really? I've never heard of anybody. The, the, to now, up to this point, and I'm 39 years old, about to be 40 here in a couple of months. The coolest thing I'd ever heard of in, in select towns, but not all towns, was called a brew-through. And they had them out at the beach. Like places like Greenville, North Carolina, it was like a drive-through beer cave where you'd pull in, and a, a hot girl in a skirt or a bikini or whatever, yeah, would rollerblade up to your car, yeah, and and say, "Hey, sir, what kind of beer would you like?" And then she would just go pick your beer out of the cooler, and you know, I'm sure uh, if those things were cold enough, you'd get a nice little show at the same time. For sure. We've got some callers weighing in. You want to go to the first one, Diesel? Yeah, you let's ready? do that. Let's go to Rock. And he wants to talk about these Venda moves. Rock, tell me about these things. Am I am I right with, yeah. with what they what wire, wire. am I getting it? Yeah, one hundred percent. So I can tell you uh that these Venda moves, there were probably close to a dozen in Cherokee County, and uh oh, that's man. how everyone got their milk. So you you pulled up and you put in your cash or whatever you were paying with. And you picked what you wanted, whether it was whole milk or whatever the selections were. And then all of a sudden, the, it would process, and here would come a carton of milk and the moo. And you would get your milk and roll on. <laughs> and you? like I say, it was a way of life for us. I thought everyone did it until I got older and realized that they were only here. Rock, did uh, you have to squeeze it out of the udder, or did you just press a button? <laughs> No, it was one press of a button, and it would come rolling down to you in the carton. That's unbelievable. uh, There was no milking of the cow. Okay, so you you didn't bring your own carton. You didn't bring your own bottle. It would just dispense a carton of milk. That's correct. And uh, they probably took these out. They've been gone for probably at least 15 years. But uh, as a kid growing up here, it was a way of life. That's that's really sad. Thank you, Rock, for that little fascinating jaunt into Cherokee County. I've never heard of these things. <laughs> Venda moves. We need to bring these back. You know, there's that there's that dairy creamery down in Anderson County or Pickens County near Clemson. We need to get that. We need to get that back as well. Let's go to Alan, who wants to talk about his hometown. Alan, what you got? Well, actually, I work in Gaffney, and Brock, Brock just told everything he did. But I'm also on the road that Cole Bryson's talking about, and I'm from the same hometown, so I may not say it, 
but uh, I won't repeat the stories that I just told about the cabin. It is very true. Now, go ahead and guess it. What, what road are you on? What road? I am on, I am on Highway 9. There we go. Highway 9. We had a guesser say Greer. He was wrong. Uh, Alan, you are 100% right. Uh, help me out on this. When I say there's one road, my hometown, everything's on the one road. I mean, everything, right? Other than Boyle Springs High School, yes. That's right. That's right. Other than the high school, everything's on one road. It is becoming Woodruff Road. It really is. <laughs> yes, it is. All right, Alan. Alan and Thanks for the call, Springs. Alan. Thank you, man. That was that was awesome. He uh, guessed it. Yep. Texter here says Boiling Springs. Uh, that he was right. Uh, let's see. Scott in Simpsonville says Brew Through was the best thing ever. Yeah, we need those. See, right? I never heard of that. We we need those, man. Never heard of it. A beer cooler, girl in a bikini on roller skates, man. Something like here that. in the station. Well, uh, can we? Can we? You uh, said here. <laughs> I mean, that would be that would be awesome. I, hey, I'd be willing to sponsor that. Uh, I, I live in Malden. We don't have anything special. You here. don't have a. Uh... No, we don't. Have... <laughs> well, we do have a Bohemian Bull. <laughs> we do have that. Uh, but we a uh, no, Bohemian Bull. There's there's nothing special about about Malden. I'm, Another I'm guy that. said the Mighty Moves real on Facebook or Twitter. I that's awesome. Uh, let's see, Madcraft. I'm guessing Greer. No, uh, John Venisette says Mighty Move Festival. There was a festival for the Mighty Move. That's there's, that's crazy. Madcraft You're says axe throwing brewery and a steakhouse all in a one minute walk. That's pretty solid for a small town. Madcraft, what's your small town? Or unless you say uh, you don't want other people to find out about it. He said an axe throwing. Hold on, let me guess. An axe throwing, a brewery and a steakhouse all within a one minute walk. We've got a, in Malden. We've got a new thing now that that looks like an old broken down castle, that's actually brand new and super expensive. How about another text validating the Vendemus? Like we have a, a a pretty good following in Gaffney, I guess, right? Yeah. So so the the Peeler family. I, I don't know if this person is saying they are in the Peeler family or if they're just talking about saying the Peeler family is who yeah. put on these Vendemus. But it sounds like these things are still really popular. That's can crazy. We, can we get these things back? Would like, you go to uh, on the way home from work? Would you go by and grab some milk? Along? <laughs> I mean, really? You would use it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, Madcraft! I was going to guess Inman, but I didn't want to sound stupid. There's no way. First of all, there's no steakhouse in Inman. Where is a steakhouse? I was. Oh man, I was going to guess it, but I was going to. I didn't want to sound like an idiot. He said there's a axe throwing brewery in a steakhouse downtown Inman. Yeah, there is. He's right. I know where the axe throwing. I know where the brewery is. Steakhouse? Where's a steakhouse in Inman? Mighty Move Festival is a longtime tradition in Cowpens. I've never been to Cowpens. Never, you haven't never, really? Never been to Cow you've Pins never been to the Battleground? I've, been, I've always wanted to. I've driven past you it a go. times, but I've never been. I'm surprised a guy like you hadn't gone. My my brother-in-law's been to it. Says it's 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 like you know it's it's real. It'll hit you. Well, they do a reenactment. The, yeah, when you think about the history, I don't think he went to a reenactment, but he's oh. just he's just experienced it and gone there, and it's like one of those things. He's like, you can feel it. You can feel it when you're on a battleground. You certainly can. You certainly can. I, I tell you what, though, a lot of good reaction. Um, I didn't see a couple of towns that I expected to see. Like Greenville, we're known for the curved suspension bridge, right? We're known for the mice on Main Street. Uh, yeah. That's, we're known for a lot of overpriced bars and restaurants. Did we see – Um, they, a texter said Duke's Mayo in Malden. That's true. Oh, that is true. Did we see Simpsonville? No, I don't think anybody is. Uh, or Fount what about Fountain Inn? We hadn't seen anybody shout out Fountain Inn. Where are you guys at? How about Where downtown I, Simpsonville, maybe man? They're just, maybe they're just trying to protect their towns. Or was it downtown? No, downtown Simpsonville, man. That place is great. getting it. It's downtown great. Downtown Simpsonville is, is, is a lot like downtown Greer, and I love both. I do too, but I think I like downtown. I, I don't know why, man. The, the, the vibes in downtown Simpsonville are really, really cool. Yeah. They really are. Pretty good places. And you got the train tracks running right through the middle of it. It's yeah, cool. It is. We didn't get that. Or uh, Fountain Inn. We did get a couple in Spartanburg, uh, like Inman. I didn't expect Inman to be on the list today, but it I, was. I'm shocked that nobody started throwing shade at other towns. Well, the, the, it's still early. This place got all the meth heads, <laughs> all, the, all the Wendy's, you know what I'm saying? Speaking of Inman. Uh, just, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. No, it's good. Listen, continue to send your thoughts in. You can throw shade, as Diesel said. Uh, and Diesel asked the question, if you're just tuning in, what makes your town unique? What's your town got that no one else around here has got? Unless what you're trying to say is well, a lot of the towns around here have a meth problem. 
Well, that could be I've true. I've heard that too. We have heard that. The ones that 85 run through, that could be true. I hate to say it, but it could be true. Madcraft shouts out the Inman Roadhouse. Hadn't been open long. Oh, that's the steakhouse he was telling. I didn't know. I guess that is. His, okay. I was wrong. I'll admit it. I will admit it. I like it. We appreciate you getting your thoughts in. Great job, audience. Great job, Diesel. As always, we'll continue the conversation, except it will be sports-related. Coming up next, I have a question. I like asking questions. My question for the next segment, we're going to go back to South Carolina and Clemson conversation. I want to know, which fan base right now does Diesel and I think have more confidence in spring practice in their starting quarterback? Find out next, only on Wire to Wire.
Wire to Wire. It is a show where you can be involved. We appreciate you making time to be a part of the program. He's Diesel. I'm Cole Bryson. I asked you before the last break, which fan base, South Carolina or Clemson, has more confidence in their starting quarterback as of March 28th, Diesel? Right now, we are just starting spring practice. We will have spring games in roughly Clemson's is next Saturday. South Carolina's, I think, is the same day or the week after. So we have about a week and a half left of spring practice. As of right now, as we turn the corner on March, which fan base do you think has the most confidence in their starting quarterback, whether it be Lenore Sellers at South Carolina or Cade Klubnick at Clemson? 844-326-3663 is the way you can get your thoughts in, or 71307. Start your message with fan. I am very interested to hear who you side with on this one in terms of what fan base is the boldest, most confident, the cockiest right now, Diesel. Who is it? Well, I think Clemson fans are shaking in their boots about another season of Cade. You think so? Yeah. Cade, we saw it last year. The decision making was not there. And, you know, he was a, what, he was a sophomore last season. Yeah. He didn't play particular. He didn't play. He didn't play bad. Like people focus on the bad parts of the season, right? They focus on uh, that instance where uh, down on the four or five yard line, instead of handing the ball off, he pulled the ball, ran to the left, and got taken down at the five yard line. Uh, mm-hmm. They look at a lot of the bad errant throws, and they say to themselves, "Wow, we ran." There were there were people legitimately having you know remorse of letting DJ Uyangalale go. Uh, after what we saw from Cade Klubnik last year. I think I know where you're going. But uh, I think Clemson fans should be should be uh, concerned Ooh. going into this season about Cade Klubnik. I mean, w- we saw him as the true freshman when he came in and just lit it up. He was fantastic in the ACC championship game. And people have this this idea in their mind. Mm-hmm. They the, Here's the problem. Clemson fans are are guilty of doing the exact same thing with him that they did with DJU. You look back the season prior to that, DJU against Notre Dame, yeah. he was phenomenal against Notre Dame in the one game that he had to play. He had nothing to lose at that point. You know, he he knew that he wasn't going to start the next game. He had no pressure on him. Go out there and ball out, and the dude did. But it didn't take long for the ACC to figure him out. It didn't. But Cade, uh, he kind of did the exact same thing. He balled out in a big game. And then once the pressure was entirely heaped on his shoulders, he fell short of expectations. And look, we we have this idea in our heads, if you're not elite as a true freshman, you're mm-hmm. not elite at all. Yeah. Like we don't give quarterbacks time to develop. We don't give them, you know, a, a sketchy freshman year, an okay sophomore year, a pretty good junior year, and wow, he was great as a senior, right? That in our minds, that's the linear progression of the way this should go. But we don't have four year startages anymore. These guys are gone most of the time after their third season. And we expect them to be tip top form as a freshman because yeah. we see guys who are tip top form. As a freshman. So Cade Klubnik fell short of expectations and maybe he takes another step this season. And I genuinely hope for his sake and for Clemson fans sake that he does. But his first full season as a starter wasn't exceptional. 290 uh, out of 454, 65% completion rate, 19 touchdowns, nine interceptions and a rating of 126. So you're going with? I'm going with Lenora Sellers. I think South Carolina fans should be really high. On Lenoris. Now, obviously, we know that Lenoris not going to have a problem seeing anything out there because he's got the big old specs and big old bottle caps sticking you out. You did out of not. His helmet. But <laughs> get this. So, this is this is an extremely limited sample size. Okay. Yeah. But if you just looked at this on paper, your eyes would bug out of your head the way it looks like Lenoris sellers do when you look at him through those bottle caps. Four for four, 100% completion, two touchdowns, oh zero gosh. interceptions. And a 445 rating. Oh my gosh! He only threw the ball four times last year, but he was don't perfect. say a butt. Don't put a butt after he only <laughs> threw the ball four times last year. Please do not. I don't want to see a butt there. You can't. You can't put a butt there. 
He only <laughs> he threw the ball four times. But he was perfect throwing the ball four times. And we know that South Carolina fans, they don't need a whole lot of logic here. They just need to feel good. Diesel says South Carolina has more confidence right now at the end of March in their quarterback than Clemson has confidence in Cade Klubnik. I will tell you this. As I, I said, wrong? well, I'll say this. As I said yesterday on the program, debate is something that we do like to include on the program. Debate is good because it allows you, the audience, to choose a side. It allows you, the listener, to say, hey, Cole was right. Diesel was right. They are absolutely moronic for thinking that. But guess what? Sometimes there's no debate. Today, on this segment, there's no debate. South Carolina fans, that's right, there it is again. They have more confidence and should have more confidence, Diesel. And they're starting quarterback. You say, well, Cole, why do you say that? Clemson's quarterback, he, he was there last year. He, he actually saw the, the in and outs of the games. He, he, he played against a lot more teams. He had a, lot more, he had a lot more reps. He's a veteran. I hear you. But I will say this. The eye test does not lie. Am I saying that Lenore Sellers is going to be a better quarterback? I'm not saying that. The question is, which fan base should have more confidence in their quarterback as of right now? I'm telling you that, Diesel, I agree with you, South Carolina should have the most confidence. They should have the most faith. And a lot of that has to do with because there is unknown, right? Anytime you have something that's unknown, you want to believe in it. You want to put faith in it. You want to have pride to say, oh, man, Lenore Sellers is going to be our guy. Anytime you don't really know the whole story, you want to be able to put the the, the effort into the believing and having faith that this could be a, a different year for South Carolina. The bad part is, just like South Carolina hasn't seen Lenore Sellers, Clemson has seen Kate Klubnick. And yeah. because of that, that is why – even though Cade Klubnick's not a terrible quarterback. Don't hear me say Cade Klubnick's not as good as Lenore Sellers. That'll be determined after this season. Diesel and I will tell you what we think about that during the season. I'm just saying, when you look at it from a standpoint of not knowing, sometimes you can have more faith in the unknown than you can of things that have already been seen, especially if hey, those things have seen are not that good. You can't you can't imagine the power of blind confidence, and South Carolina fans have that in spades. Have it in spades. Well, they've got to. Yeah, because there is none in the in the substance, right? Yeah. So you have to believe in it. Mongo says Diesel is spitting facts. God, Mongo, this is terrible. Wreck specs for life. God, y'all are hating on that yeah. guy. <laughs> You and Mongo both. What do y'all have against people that wear you know, glasses? You know what I love about Mongo is we can piss Mongo off early in the show, mm -hmm. and then he'll text right back later on in the show having a good time. That's, well, that's, that's what that's it's what supposed like to be, man. About Mongo, we can all we can all go at each other and and be buddies five minutes later. That's, that's the way it's supposed to be. That's the same way the show is with me and you. It's great. It's all in fun. Texter says I think Sellers can be dynamic but we don't have more confidence in him than Clemson fans have in Klubnik yet. Hmm. I don't think Clemson fans have a ton of to have I don't. A ton of faith in, in Cade Klubnik anyway. I mean, look, if we, you were to ask 100 Clemson fans, 100 yeah. Clemson fans, do you think 50 of them would say that they have faith? Here's, here's what we haven't talked about yet. Clemson has now set a precedent multiple years in a row mm -hmm. of benching the incumbent star for the unknown rookie freshman, sophomore who hasn't played much. They've done this multiple years in a row. It's, they took out Kelly Bryant so DJ Uyunglele could play. They could they took out DJ Uyunglele so that Cade Klubnik could play. Are we going to be in a situation now that Cade has had a full season under his belt? Hasn't been spectacular. Hadn't, wasn't, wasn't bad. No. Wasn't bad. No. But if, if, what if, we talked about it before, what if Clemson loses to Georgia badly? What if Clemson has a subpar showing, or God forbid, loses to App State. Are we at that point where fans will start saying, 
We want Vizina. Of course. Vizina. Of course. Of course. Are. Because that's the precedent that Clemson has set and that Clemson fans have come it, to expect. The worst part of this conversation is the worst thing that could happen to this conversation is that Clemson does play Georgia to start the season. So guess what? They're going into the 2024 season with a bad taste in their mouth talking about Kate Klubnick. And they're not going to get that taste out of their mouth probably until App State or maybe a little bit more on after the bye week you have NC State. Speaking of which, we do have a poll on this up at the Fan Upstate on Twitter. The poll reads, Diesel says South Carolina fans have more confidence in Lenora Sellers going into 2024 than Clemson fans have in Cade Klubnick. Choices are he's right or he's wrong. You go to the, Diesel, the, uh, the Fan Upstate on Twitter. And vote in the poll. It's live for you right now. Hmm. Mongo says Kane Clubfoot is Willie Corn 2.0. Maybe Cade Clubnick would be a hell of an OC one day. He might be because Willie has been. <laughs> yeah, he has. Yeah, he has. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's interesting. But my final point is Lenore Sellers did look good last year. Yeah. Did he play four? Uh, he had a four fifty four yeah, rating. I <laughs> get it. Listen, we understand that he didn't play a lot, but the it's good not, thing is Carolina fans saw that and they can have faith because they saw something that well, has not, potential. What's not fair about it is is uh, Lenora Sellers can stand on one goal line, look at the cheerleaders outside of the other end zone, and, and, oh and my read God. and read the no, label you on their on their. No, you didn't. Skirts. No, you yeah, didn't just say didn't that. Say that. I, it's not fair. These glasses, man. There's something bionic going on in these things. It is wire to wire. We got one more hour to go. Congratulations if you've listened for the first three hours and you plan to listen for one more. Tolo. You are a Tolo. You are listening. Hour for, uh, turn, you are turning it on and you are leaving it on. That's what we want you to do here on Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson. When we come back, just hours away. Now, just an hour and a few minutes away. From Clemson tipping off against Arizona, the seven and a half point favorite Arizona Wildcats. Can they do it? Can they advance? And if they do, where does it rank in Clemson's seasons overall? That'll be next on Wire to Wire here on the Fan Up State.
It is Wire to Wire. It is a show for you. He's Diesel. I'm Cole Bryson. We appreciate you being a part of the program in one hour from now. Clemson Basketball Diesel, they may be able to punch their ticket to the Elite Eight. Can you believe it? Can you believe we are even talking about Clemson basketball with a chance to go to the Elite Eight? Well, you better believe it because, like I said, one hour away, those guys are going to be tipping off, and I – and picking the Clemson Tigers to upset, three in a row, upset the Arizona Wildcats 73-70. to 70. Diesel, agree or disagree? I disagree with you there, but I think Come this on, is man. where the run comes to an end. Clemson, Come of course, on, they don't Diesel. qualify as, as a, a Cinderella in this tournament, as a six seed. You don't qualify. No, I agree. There's no way. But – uh, look, again, I give this team an awful lot of credit for what they've achieved to this point. They probably should have been bounced last last uh, week against Baylor. Uh, they they blew New Mexico out of the out of the gym. They had a huge lead against Baylor. They looked fantastic against Baylor, and had had they not lost the sixteen point lead and let it get all the way down to two points with a minute to play in that game, uh, I would have I would probably be almost as high as uh, as you are on Clemson right now really be that high on their supply but ha- that is a concerning thing to happen that is a concerning thing to happen a a, a, a 14 point run in that game and, and it took baylor missing two free throws a guy that's usually pretty good at, at hitting free throws basically to preserve their lead that's what scares me about this team and we talked about it a lot over the last couple of days about you know uh, what happened towards the end of that game with PJ Hall? You said that they looked a lot better without PJ Hall in that game. But this is going to be an interesting, interesting thing to see how much pressure is on Clemson. And speaking of pressure, uh, we're going to replay an interview from earlier in the show next, uh, where we talked to PJ Hall's high school basketball coach from Dorman. What a good interview uh, it was that was! A fantastic interview. I mean. We're, we, we were trying to go inside the mind of P.J. Hall with his high school basketball coach, and if you missed it, you're going to hear it replayed coming up here in the very next segment on Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson. I really believe that this would rank in the top four for greatest Clemson athletic accomplishments. I like the 1981 football national championship being the number one. And then I say the 2016 national championship to follow. I think the 2018 national championship should follow that at three. And then, you know, most people say like uh, the soccer national championships, 2021, 2023. Look, those were great. But let's be honest. Let's call it like we see it, Diesel. Soccer's not a major sport, right? No. It's not basketball. It's not football. It's not it's baseball. It's never going to be in this country. No. I don't care what you people say. It's no. never going to be a major sport. I agree. Country. And because of that, tell me if you agree or disagree, Diesel, Texter, Streamers, Tolos, we want your opinion. I believe this Elite Eight berth, if they were to win the night, would propel that above the soccer national championships. Now, listen. If you have some tie to the soccer program at Clemson, I get it. That's important to you. But for 90% of the Clemson fans, they have no tie. Diesel said it earlier. Yeah, they, they're excited about it. Woo, we won a soccer national title. Yeah, but they, they, they found out the next day when they got the uh, notification exactly. first thing in the morning. That's when they found out. They weren't watching they it. They didn't know. No, they weren't. So I'll say this. I do like Clemson tonight. We did talk to Thomas Ryan. We did ask him about P.J.'s. You know, uh, what makes him tick? We asked, I asked him about the, the three point shot. PJ was 0 for 1 last uh, Sunday against Baylor. Diesel, I really think that we talk about it all the time. Sometimes teams force the three ball. And especially when teams start to like realize the game's over, they'll start jacking them up more. I don't want to say that Clemson has to, to force the three ball tonight. But you'll hear the interview with Thomas Ryan, and I won't say what he said when I asked him this question, but I do think that the three ball, not just from P.J., but other players, is going to have to be predominant tonight. I think they're going to have to shoot shots because you so said what it. you're saying is they're going to have to be great at something they are not particularly great at as a team. They like to get the ball inside. Yeah. They like to get the ball down low. And you know where that's going to come from is uh, – the the, need, the the feeling like they need to do that. It's going to come from the inexperience of being in these positions, being down 
you know, this team doesn't have a lot of tournament experience. No. This team got bounced in the first round of the NIT last year by Moorhead State. They've only got two games of experience in this tournament. First game, they, they blew New Mexico out. Second game, they got a big on Baylor, and they let a, a late run happen. I look at that late run as, as an inexperienced run. And Brad Brownell here, here in this clip talks about the lack of experience in the tournament for his team. Yeah, don't just be happy to be here. You know, at one point during the season, I think it was in January when we were struggling, I had a, a really hard meeting with our players. And, and uh, you know, I told them I was, you know, we were teetering a little bit. We had an unbelievable November and December. We were, I don't know if it's just so excited to play. And we played a really hard schedule. And we won a bunch of games. And we were, we had like no adversity. And we were 10 and 1 and playing great. And then, came back from Christmas and got smacked in the mouth by some teams in our league um, and had a hard time stringing some games together. We lost a bunch of close games, one, one point games. And uh, at one point I told our team, I think we were four and six in the ACC. And I said, guys, you know, we need to understand something. Um, I think some of you guys think we're the 10 and one team. We're right now we're the four and six team. And if we go four and six again, we won't be playing in the NCAA tournament. And I said, that'd be a shame because of what you did the first two months of the year, but also because I think we're good enough to go to the final four. And uh, that's not something that I throw around uh, easily. And I asked my older players, have you ever heard me say that to you? And they said, no. Brad's got confidence in his team. Well, he should. He thought they were good enough to be a final four team. Wait, here's the reality of it. Three weeks ago, Diesel, if me and you were uh, sitting here or at a local establishment shooting the bull about Clemson basketball, and I said, hey, Diesel, you think Clemson's a Final Four team? You and I would have probably said, no, they're not I'd a Final Four. not a Final Four team in the NIT. <laughs> or, the, or the BET. You're, ter or the you're terrible. GPT. You're te chat tournament. GPT tournament. You're awful. You're, you're, you're absolutely terrible. You're going to take Brad as flowers tomorrow. So my point is, I said this earlier, if you're just tuning into the program, one unique thing about basketball, especially March Madness, boy, can a storyline change. Like the national media won't talk about Clemson in this storyline because they don't cover Clemson to this degree. But everyone who covers them, Thomas Ryan, will t you know, he'll, he'll talk about it. Coming up next in the program. Three weeks ago, Diesel, Brad Brownell – he lost in the first round of the ACC he tournament. If he were to have lost to New Mexico, he is gone. Adios. Hasta la vista, right? Am I wrong? No, you're, you're absolutely I mean, right. He's, there's no and, and way. He's been justified for doing it. For sure. Two back-to-back -back losses in both tournaments. He's gone. In NCAA March Madness, I can't recall any other sport where you can literally change the storyline, change the narrative from two weeks ago so now all of a sudden, today is March 28th. If Brad Brownell somehow pulls this thing out of his you-know-what tonight, Diesel, he will be one of the final eight teams in the tournament. That is unreal to sit here and say out loud into a microphone. That doesn't seem real. That doesn't seem legit that Clemson could be an elite eight team, but the tournament, it's a... Uh, it's a it's a it's a different animal, right? Yeah, it's would, a funny lady. It, it's a different lady. You just don't know. Said, if you had told me that a couple of weeks ago, I would ask, "Who's been spiking the vendamoos up in Gaffney County? Ooh. Who's been putting something funky in the milk up there in Gaffney County?" I mean, I, like, there's no way I saw this team getting getting uh, this far. Uh, let's see. Texer says the 81 championship shouldn't count. Uh, 215 pages of NCAA violations. After that season, yeah, that's that's Mongo. That's a Gamecock fan trying to take it away from the Clemson Tigers, but they got they got the trophy, Mongo. There's there's nothing you could do about it at this point. It can't hurt you anymore, even though it seems like it does. Uh, let's see. We're looking for your score predictions on the YouTube chat, or YouTube, Facebook, or X chat. Uh, let's see. Madcraft has Arizona winning big, eighty nine to seventy four. We will also accept your predictions on the text line. 71307. Start your text with keyword fan. If you want to make a prediction for tonight's Clemson Arizona game, hit us up with that. Uh, Clemson is a seven and a half point dog in this game. I see Clemson we, covering, but just barely. Let's let's park there for a second. Yeah. On the spread. Seven and a half points to me seems like a lot. I I, I get that Arizona's really good, 
Mm-hmm. And I get that they can shoot with the best of them. Their offense is is electric. I know that that sounds weird coming from a basketball program. A basket, we usually use that on the football field, but their basketball, their offense, man, their offense is high powered. So let's compare that here for a second mm-hmm. to the only thing that we have, to what we have that's that's relatively close in in stature. Okay, this is uh, what the two six matchup. Tomorrow we have the one five matchup. Yeah. Between uh, Purdue and Gonzaga, Purdue is a five and a half point favorite in that, and then we've got the two eleven matchup, and Marquette is a six and a half point favorite in that. Hmm. That is a bigger spread between the two uh, seeds. That's that's nine spots between the seeds. Clemson, Arizona is four spots between the seeds, but yet they see as NC State as having a better chance to upset Marquette than Clemson has. In upsetting Arizona, Marquette's two seed, twenty-seven and nine basketball team, an exceptional basketball team that Marquette is. I mean, that, I, I hope, I hope that Brad Brownell is in the locker room talking about that disrespect card because Clemson's being yeah. dogged. I think you will be, and the you spread, know, by the way, has come down. I didn't realize this. The spread has come down since earlier today. Uh, it was seven and a half. Now it's six and a half. It's right now six and a half. Yeah. Which is, which means there's much. ESPN. Well, that's interesting because, ESPN. you know, if Clemson's the underdog and a game where they're they're used to being the underdog, it is interesting to see where the money is going to be. You know, from a Vegas standpoint, I just think six and a half, seven and a half. It may end up being right around six and a half. I like it from a betting perspective. I think there's value on the Clemson money line because if you're going to give them six and a half points. And you believe that Clemson's going to win? Instead of taking them to cover the spread, take them to take t- take them take them on the money line, and I think that's a lot better value. Uh, you're you're going to get a better return than your investment, and I think there's a very legitimate possibility of it happening. I, I, I mean, we talked about Arizona a, a few minutes ago, back in well, even back in the first hour, Diesel. Uh, one of the things that you said was both teams have to be themselves tonight. You know, what's been interesting with this Clemson team, during the season, P.J. Hall's their leading scorer, right? He's their guy. He's their M.O. But what's interesting now, all of a sudden, a guy like Chase Hunter, my brain immediately goes to maybe Chase Hunter can now be a threat that teams have to account for because it was talked about. We said it on this show. When you scout Clemson, P.J. Hall is the first guy that, you hit on the scouting report. P.J. Hall is going to get your best defender, maybe two, right? If you watch the Baylor game, anytime P.J. Hall caught the basketball and tried to back down into the paint, it was very obvious that Baylor had him at the top of their scouting report. They were going to do everything they could to to eliminate P.J. Hall from getting easy baskets at the rim. However, we've said all week that uh, that P.J. Hall is the X factor. P.J. is the X factor. However, a guy like Chase Hunter – in my opinion, I think there's a ton of value in him tonight because we talk about needing the three ball. If he can hit a couple of shots early and keep this game close and maybe even build a lead, man, would that allow Clemson to play so much more freely? They have been at the luxury the first two games of having a lead, playing with a lead, relying on the defense to kind of set the style of play, the pace of play. That, to me, is the biggest thing to watch tonight Does Arizona jump on Clemson? If Arizona Diesel, I want to say this. I could be dead wrong. We'll talk about this tomorrow. If Arizona jumps on Clemson early, I think the game's over. I don't think Clemson's come back. They're not. I don't think they have the shooters to come back. So if if Arizona goes up 12-2, 12-4, goes on a run, whatever it may be, I worry. I think Clemson has to stay pretty close, you know, and, and even if they could somehow get off to a hot start and get a lead like they did against Baylor. Because at one point in the first half, Clemson was all over Baylor. That helped them so much down the stretch. I don't know that Clemson's built, like you said, to come back. Yeah, and a little bit more that we can glean out of some of these Vegas numbers. Vegas sets the over-under at 152.5 with a a 6.5 point spread, which means uh, to me that Vegas sees this game at basically a 79-73 Arizona winning basketball game. 79-70 or something like that to 73. 
And that's pretty much where I saw it. I didn't know this until after uh, after I'd already made my pick earlier, which was 80 to 73 Clemson. I do see Clemson beating the spread, well, which the old spread, the seven and a half point spread. Now I see them losing the spread. Now that the spread has changed. Yeah. Um, but I mean, yeah, it, 79, 73 Arizona win in this game. That's what that's basically what Vegas sees. And you picked 80. I well, picked 80 to 73. And I picked Clemson 73 to 70. But we talk about this in football all the time. The last thing Clemson wants to do tonight is get into a, a track meet. Mongo says Arizona 92, Tater Tech 62. Mongo. <laughs> Mongo. It's mean, Mongo. Mongo. You're trying to start. Are you there. trying to start something? Mongo. Joey says Clemson already busted my bracket by beating Baylor. So 82-79. Clemson moves on to the Elite Eight. Uh Anonymous texter here. Texters, do us a favor. Make sure you put your name on your texts, please. Um, 86 to 80, Clemson wins the game, so this texter says. Another texter here says, if Clemson is going to win, it's going to have to be a low-scoring defensive win. Clemson 68, Arizona 65. You're calling them to hold Arizona 15 points below their season average. There's no way. I don't see that. There's no way. I don't see that at all. That's, That's low. That is low. Hey, I've been wrong low, many, low. many times before. My wife tells me very often that that's the case. That's low, man. Yep. If listen, if they if they hold them to sixty five, yeah, they're gonna win. There's no doubt about that. But I just don't see that happening. Arizona offensively, it's gonna be a lot to handle. It's going to be a lot to handle. But I cannot wait. When we come back, we talk to Thomas Ryan, who is PJ Hall's high school basketball coach at Dorman. Just a fantastic. Very insightful call. We go deep in the mind of PJ Hall. That's next here on Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson. We are the fan upstate.
as Coach Thomas Ryan was P.J. Hall's high school basketball coach. If you're from the area, you probably knew that already. However, there are a lot of people who are uh, new to the area and may not have known that. But uh, we now bring in the head basketball coach of the Dorman Cavaliers, Coach Thomas Ryan. Coach, first of all, we appreciate you taking time to join us. How excited are you to see one of your former players have a chance to punch their ticket to the Elite Eight? Well, I'm really excited. Can't wait. Happy for PJ. I was texting him last night. He he's excited and pumped. And uh, what a what an incredible career the kids had. And then to come through here, and in the in the tournament like he has and their team has is, is quite an accomplishment. I'm just really really proud of him. Thomas Ryan, head coach of Dorman basketball. Now, uh, Thomas. PJ is not the only player that's come out of your program who's made uh, who's made a name for himself and has had one heck of a season. Miles Tate up at App State, he had himself a really great season as well up there. Uh, but we talked a lot over the past couple of days about about PJ Hall's foul trouble in the last game there against Baylor. We saw the emotion coming out of, of PJ Hall. So uh, things change, people grow, people change over a couple of years, and it's been four years since you've coached. Uh, PJ Hall, but can you describe PJ as a player in high school? What was his emotional center like when he played for you? Well, I think it's similar. I mean, PJ plays with a lot of emotion. I mean, he's a high energy kid. He's competitive. You know, he wants to win. Sometimes his, you know, happy go lucky attitude maybe, um, you know, gets a little bit in the way, but I think it's what makes him good. So you kind of have to take the positive with the negative there. Obviously, him, him staying out of foul trouble is huge tonight. I mean, you can't, even, you know, and it, and it has been for Clemson all year, and there's been struggles with that from PJ. I mean, even the other night, I thought for a long time he, he did well, but then had a, you know, got caught up in the air a couple of times where he probably just needed to, you know, keep his feet. And I think that's going to be a problem with PJ if somebody shows him that ball. You know, he goes for it, leaves it. When you get up in the air, you have, you know, you're in trouble. They they they, they control the scenario, and he's got a couple of tough fouls. Now, I'm also going to be honest with you. And this is the coach with the. You know, Dorman Cavalier glasses on. I, mean, I think PJ also, if you look at the course year and just track every game, has not been the beneficiary of some 50 50 calls on both ends, offensively and defensively. And hopefully, in an NCAA tournament you know, game, Sweet 16 game, you, you have to feel like those officials are going to, you know, let them play through it, let the guys decide on the floor. So I think that actually plays in PJ's advantage. Coach, when you look at the style of play that P.J. plays with, you're exactly right. He does play with a ton of emotion. But I wanted to ask you about a comment that Brad Brownell made after the game that I thought was very fascinating when talking about P.J. Hall. He said that he was way too hard on him throughout the game. Can you explain for our listeners out there what he really meant by that? Or I know obviously we can't put words in his mouth, but being a coach, when you say you're too hard on a kid, I would assume that you know what buttons to push and what buttons not to push, right, during the course of a game. What do you think he meant by that? Well, I think that's probably multifaceted there, okay? Coaching P.J. over a long haul, and you know, I was fortunate to coach P.J. for four or five years, three years on varsity, but he was in our program. I mean, his – you've already used the word happy-go-lucky attitude can sometimes, as a coach, you want to grit your teeth and you almost want to just put your hands on him and say, P.J., so let's go, man, like, you know. I've told you this 10 times. Um, and, and then, you know, so, so I think there's that part of it. And then, listen, let's be honest. Clemson's team, in, including Coach Burnell and P.J., have been under a ton of pressure the last 10 days, okay? Yeah. If not, two to three weeks. And really what I heard coming out of Coach Burnell's mouth is a little bit of that pressure after, the, you know, the Boston College debacle and the ACC tournament, losing, I think, three or four coming in. I just think that their their whole team, PJ, Coach Brunell, everybody was a little bit on edge. And I think as a coach, when you're on edge and as a player, you're on edge, you sometimes have some of those interactions. And, you know, I remember back to PJ's freshman year. Again, this is, you know, PJ's high school coach talking. I thought Brad was very, very tough on PJ. And, and we weren't we expecting more from him early. Their relationship's grown over these four years. I know Coach Brunell great and good friends with him. And it's been a – it's been a journey, and now they love each other. You know, not that they didn't like each other at the start, but it was a frustrating. You get a top 50 recruit, you want him to immediately impact. And as a freshman, PJ was just a role player. And now, so I, I just think it's a culmination of a career together, trusting each other, loving each other, but then wanting it so bad, emotions run high. Coach, you said something there that I thought was interesting um, earlier when you started talking about PJ and Brownell with the pressure. Do you feel like, obviously, I agree 100% with you, especially after that ACC tournament loss, there was a ton of pressure. 
and then you you beat New Mexico, maybe that takes a little bit of pressure off, and then you beat Baylor. Would you say now that the pressure's off Clemson and Brad Brownell and P.J. Hall, or do you still think there's some pressure there tonight? I don't. I honestly, I, I feel like that Clemson's team is really going to come out loose tonight. And obviously, you've got the pressure of a Sweet 16. Now, anybody feels that. I, I'd be surprised if this team doesn't come out about as loose as they could, coaches included. Uh, you know, I've just been very close to the program and kind of tracked, you know, everything that's going on. And it's been a, as good a year, as, especially how they started out, how they finished. Um, it's been a, it's been a ton to deal with for that team because they are talented. They're really good. They've got a chance to – I feel like they've got as good a chance as anything to win tonight. I really do. I think it's a good matchup for them, um, uh, especially if Chase Hunter plays well. I think he's kind of the key. When he plays well, Clemson is really, really tough. Um, and I would also expect P.J. to play a little better than he has in the first two rounds. I thought P.J., because of foul trouble, was just okay. Um, but I, I feel like this Clemson team and coaches comes into this really with the, everybody else has got pressure on them, not clumps. Joined by uh, P.J. Hall's high school basketball coach, Thomas Ryan, head coach of the Dorman Cavaliers. Uh, let's go back to, uh, you know, P.J.'s mindset. You, you obviously spent an awful lot of time with him. Take us inside his head. Like, what makes P.J. Hall tick? You, you hear coaches say things like, uh, you, you have to figure out what makes each individual player tick, what motivates them. Some of them you have to get in their faces and you have to yell at them. Some of them you have to put your arm around them and tell them everything is going to be okay. Uh, so which which one of those types of guys is P.J. or is it situational? Well, I think it's situational. I think P.J. responds both ways. I, I think you got to put your arm around him. He's got to know he can care about him. He loves him and Coach Brunel and him have that that, that love relationship. Um, I felt that same way when P.J. was at, was at Dorman. Um, but also, P.J. can take the tough coach. And also, and this is where I give his family credit. You know, Jerome, Melanie, his sister Thayer. I mean, he comes from an athletic family that understands what it takes to win at a high level. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think any Coach Brunell or myself or anybody coaches can take credit for him just growing up in a situation of, hey, if you want to be great, this is what you do. This is how you handle coaching. This is how you respond. And then just having that competitive edge about you. Coach, when you look at P.J.'s game on the floor, I thought that was a great answer, by the way, but when you look at his game on the floor, especially tonight against a team like Arizona that really can get up and down the floor and score with the best of them, score over 100 just a few weeks ago, do you feel like tonight, and we're talking specifically about P.J. because we're talking to you and you coached him, do you feel like the three-point game has to be part of P.J.'s game tonight in order for Clemson to get to the Elite Eight? I, you know, I really do. I think that's a good point. I think all year long I've been saying, P.J., get in the paint, get down there, make a play in the post. And I think most Clemson fans have said that. Said that. But I think tonight, him stretching Arizona seven-footer, I don't know if I'm saying it right, Ballo or, you know, the big boy, the seven-footer, could be a matchup problem for P.J. And he may he may go on shuffling. I, I don't know how they'll play that. I don't know Arizona great. But I do think P.J. stretching the floor tonight could be huge in this game. If he can make two or three threes, um, you know, I don't even know, did he, I don't even think he shot one against Baylor. I he was 0 for 1. 0 for 1, okay. And so he really did get into the, into the paint, did what, you know, probably a lot of times we've been begging him to do all, all year. But the bottom line is, even in high school, PJ's game is, hey, you know, inside and out. And, you know, and he knows that, you know, and tonight I really believe PJ needs to hit two or three threes for them to win and stretch that Arizona defense. Now, I'm going to ask you a, a deep, dark question here, uh, Thomas. Thomas Ryan, head coach of Dorman Basketball. We spent a lot of time debating this on this show, and we know how much uh, PJ and his family uh, really love Brad Brownell. But in your mind, your mind, if, if Clemson loses this game tonight and they don't advance any farther, do you think Brad Brownell should be extended farther than he currently is? Or in your mind, do you think you know his time at Clemson is kind of coming to an end? No, I mean, listen, Sweet 16 finish. I mean, I, I think that his contract has to be extended. Um, you know, I, obviously the last two or three weeks has been, you know, you know, back and forth. But uh, Brad's a great coach. He relates to his kids. He's really learned how to use the transfer portal in a way that's advantageous for Clemson. I think he'll continue to do that. I think the Sweet 16 run will give him even more opportunities in that transfer portal. And, and let's be honest. I mean, hey, it's hard. It's hard. I mean, you know, South Carolina this year, and we didn't mention we mentioned the last tape, but Talon Cooper, who played point guard for us at Dorman, they win the most games in school history this year, but losing the first round. Okay, 
and, and, and they, I thought they got a terrible matchup with Oregon. But, I mean, this Clemson team has made the Sweet 16, and that just can't be overlooked. Oh, man, that's big time at Clemson. Coach, before we let you go, one thing that I haven't asked that I did want to get to was something that we got a lot of reaction from earlier in the week after the Baylor game. And I know you watched that game, and I want you as a basketball guy who knows the X's and O's a lot better than we do, help me understand, like, when I was watching that game, it almost figured out against Baylor, it almost felt like, Coach, that at times Clemson was figuring out a way to win uh, behind the efforts of Hunter and play well without P.J., and then he comes on the floor late in that game, and to me it almost felt like that's kind of when Baylor crept back in. Is there anything to that in your opinion, or is that something that you just think was coincidence? I mean, I think it's coincidence. I think Chase Hunter was playing really, really well. Uh, you know, I, I think I think Baylor started kind of turning the screws of getting downhill, and the game kind of in that last six minutes kind of changed. I mean, P.J. had been out for a while. I don't know that I put a whole lot into that. You know, obviously I'd have loved to seen us just get what he, he went back in after foul trouble, get him down low and, and give him a touch and see what, uh, you know, see what he can do. At the same time, let's not forget this Clemson team. While I mean, PJ Hunter's an All American, uh, PJ Hall's an All American in my book. Uh, Chase Hunter, Gerard, uh, Shefflin. I mean, those guys are, are really big pieces, and I think they're pretty confident spreading that thing around. And you know, and and, and Godfrey was playing well. I, I just think that's what makes this this Clemson team now. Jack Clark is defensive stopper. Seems a little deeper than people realize. Coach Thomas Ryan, head coach of Dorman Basketball, PJ Hall's high school basketball coach, joins us here on Wire to Wire with Diesel and Cole Bryson on the Fan Upstate. Uh, one more question uh, here for me. Uh, I want to know about you and your program going forward, the Dorman U Cavaliers. Uh, how do you feel about your 2024 season, and who's going to be the next big name to come out of Dorman U? Yeah, I mean, we had a good season, went 21-8. and eight. Uh, We finished second in our region, a third-round playoffs, made it to the Elite Eight. And, you know, for, for our people and, and even for me, we've been spoiled a little bit over the last decade. Um, but a little disappointing, um, you know, you know, just been blessed to play in six state championships in the last previous eight years. And this year we just didn't quite have that. Christian Andrews had a great year for us, all-state player, still figuring out where he's going to play next year. Uh, but we're really looking forward to some young kids that we feel really good about. Hayden Brazil's brother Jalen is at USC Upstate. He, he, he was a sophomore starter for us at point guard. Um, you know, Will Bush, another sophomore that'll be a junior, six seven kid that we think's a college player. And so we're pretty excited about the future. Still a little bit young, but we have nine returners from last year after winning twenty one games. And anytime you win twenty plus games in high school in a twenty six game season, you're you're pleased. We just didn't make quite as deep a run. But pr- proud of what we did this year, accomplished. We just didn't have, you know. Didn't necessarily have a PJ Hall or a Miles Tate or a Talon Cooper. Sometimes <laughs> when you don't have that, it makes it a little tough. Coach, we appreciate it. Listen, today's opening day of baseball. I'm going to switch gears before I let you go. I'm going to ask Diesel, my co host, this question in a little while. But if Thomas Ryan had to get on the rubber, tow the rubber from 60 feet, six inches, throwing out the first pitch, could we hit a strike? What are the odds of Thomas Ryan throwing a strike from 60 feet away? Well, I don't know if I'm looking at Kim Mulkey, who thought she threw a strike and got thrown out at the Savannah. I, I, I'll give Mulkey over Ryan right now, but I, I, I'm not going to kick dirt on the referee like that. Uh, on fire like that. But uh, was that not something else? Unbelievable. Hey, I, I, absolutely. I'm an athlete, man. I throw a strike in a heartbeat. Coach, <laughs> we appreciate it, man. Uh, enjoy the game tonight, and we uh, really appreciate it. Looking forward to talking to you again real soon. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Appreciate y'all. Yes, sir. That's Thomas Ryan. So is the chance that it's gotta be somewhere. When this joker is over, I'm uploading these. I'm already got these things uploaded. I'm on me and you both dash. Clemson game starts at seven. We don't get out there till seven. How long is it from you here to your house? About twenty minutes door to door. That's not bad. I'm very jealous of that. That's about forty. Last year, having a uh, the year before last, having to drive up to Portland Springs every week for uh, yeah uh, for that Panther show, man, yeah. that was a haul. Uh, I got all the way up there one time. It was 
it was that day that it was like minus eight degrees. Yeah. Uh, I got all the way up there and they didn't even tell me that they weren't open that day. Uh uh-uh. uh. So I drove all the way there Ooh. to do a show and there was nobody there. I know Scott on it real well. It's a good place though. Yeah, I like the bar a lot. Yeah, it's nice. That's what I'm debating. Go home and watch the game or find somewhere a lot closer and watch it. Okay, so now we need to put our mics back into utility. I did it. Oh, they can. CBS Sports Radio. Hot mic. Hot mic. We mean JD. Hot mic. Maybe, maybe it ain't a hot mic. Maybe it's supposed to be this way, man. Maybe it's supposed to be this way, JD. How do you know it's not supposed to be this way? It's not a hot mic if it's intentional. Yeah, joke's on you, JD. It ain't a hot mic. We did it on purpose. (laughs) Cole, that is your favorite promo, isn't it? You love that promo. Grip this is where I baby. say yeah. no comment. <laughs> Giving JD a hard time during the break. Oh, that's good stuff. Good stuff, JD. We appreciate you. See, hey, it's up to you. You're the one who made it, made it perverted. It was not perverted. Oh, really? I wrote this thing. Oh, really? Yeah. You're blaming me. Yeah, you guys, you guys back me up on this, okay? JD. Are we really going section, here right now? All y'all who grew up playing baseball. Oh, my. Gosh. Everybody who grew up playing golf. You know what grip it and rip it means. It means just go out there and swing away. Swing loose. That's what I think, too. That's not what you think. That's what I think. Because you've made it perverted. No, I haven't. Times. Yeah, no, I haven't. It. Never one time. Yeah. Never one time. What did you say? What, what was your uh, your <laughs> spoof on it? Tag it and bag it? No, what was it? <laughs> Tag it and bag That's terrible. I'm trying to remember what mine was, but I already forgot something. Now I forgot. I forgot. I'll I get back you. to it. Hey, real quick, before you. before we get into this final segment. There was some discussion earlier in the chat. For those just tuning in, uh, there was a little bit of discussion about what the word Tolo meant. Did you see that? That's good discussion. We want that discussion. JD, Madcraft, Spur Daddy, those guys were doing a a really good job of helping the other Tolos understand what Tolo is. It's formerly P1, but on this program, we encourage you to turn it on and leave it on. Many times during the show, you'll hear us say that. You'll hear the promo say that. Turn on, leave on. That spells Tolo. You, the Tolo, we want you to be a part of the program. And they have already. Tremendous job. And I'll interrupt by uh, saying one more thing, Diesel, and then I'll quit talking. Appreciate two text messages that came in just a few minutes ago. Uh, The text line has been absolutely fantastic today, by the way. One texter said, enjoying the new show. Will this show be a little nicer to my Gamecocks come football season? That was Keith and TR. Well, we appreciate that. Up to your game. That's right, there, Keith and TR. The next you know, one. Only we're other we're text. Not here to only say nice things about you. We'll say nice things about you if you deserve it. Only other text I wanted to get to real quick. Fan, you guys are doing a great job. I'm really enjoying the new show Dang. and its content. Looking forward to much more. We really appreciate all the kind words. JD says, "The longer I stand over a golf ball, the worse it will be." That's true. That's true. That's true. You just got to get up there and grip it and rip it, baby. Yeah. Grip it and rip it. I like it. I like it. I did not know it was a golf term, but now I do. He says, toot the horn, toot, toot. Um, this is this is a random side note. Like We go off the rails here in the last 10, 15 minutes of the show. Uh, have you seen this new Enios Grenadier vehicle? It's a new SUV. It's made by a company called no. Enios. The guy who, who owns the company was a huge fav- uh, fan of the old school – uh, Land Rovers. So he won in court the right to use the de- essential design of the old Land Rover. Ah, uh-huh. and this is going to be the most British thing you've ever heard. You made fun of me for liking 
uh, electric cars. Yeah. Like in the potential future of electric cars. Yeah. There's a regular horn on this thing. It's loud AF. Uh -huh. But then because it's a British company and they plan on selling a whole bunch of these things in England, it has a toot button on it. It's cool. Yeah. It, it's, it has just like a little toot toot, little What's small up, horn so you can alert cyclists this? on the road that Jeff, that you got uh, that you got a car behind you. Uh, let's see here. Texter says, yeah. I believe Tolo is the radio equivalent to Clemson students doing the claw. Do what? I believe Tolo is the radio equivalent to Clemson students doing the claw. He's he's throwing shade. You know what? You know, these Clemson students are doing this like thing. It's so lame. Hmm. He's calling he's calling Tolo's lame. Tolo's going to let him do that to you. That's Joey coming after you. I don't know. Uh, I don't really get that. If it was a good joke, I would get it. But uh, try again, Joey. Uh, let's see. Scotty from BMW says, this show is awesome. Ah, Miss Mark, but love you guys as well. Best of luck. Scotty, we appreciate it Thank from you, BMW. We just need you here each and every day. Turn it on. Leave it on, baby. Tolo. Yep. Hey, speaking of Tolo, I think we have a Tolo. Uh, Jeff wanting to get his hey. thoughts in on the new show. What's up, man? Hey, what's up, Cole? I've always enjoyed your uh, high school perspective. Uh, love the show, brother. And Diesel, as always, man, how you doing? Doing great, bro. Where are you calling us from today? Uh, still in Boiling Springs. Oh, Damn. Okay. So you two uh, are there hanging out together, conspiring together. Huh? That's right. That's that's my hometown, <laughs> Jeff. Yes, sir. I'm, always, I'm looking forward to another good football season from Boiling Springs, if we can put it together. Without a doubt. And, uh, you know, just looking for your good – your good high school perspective, as usual. We, hey, listen, we appreciate you being a part of the program. Uh, did you hear the segment a minute ago when we were talking about Tolo? Did you get that? Yeah, I get it. Okay, so it. we appreciate you. Listen, you're a uh, you're someone that picks up on things quickly, obviously. Some people we have to explain it to and talk slower for those in Gaffney, right? Uh, no shots fired there. But, hey, listen, we want you, Jeff, to turn it on and leave it on, man. We appreciate you. You got me, brother, all the way. All right, you can get in touch with the show, 844-FAN-PHONE. We appreciate all of the calls today. Diesel, what a good, like, we've had a ton of text interaction. Do you know, Texter, that when you text the show, it makes the program better? We really do appreciate we it. We love it. We love we it. We love it. And, and I love the fact that earlier in the show, we were talking about Florida State now believing they have an out with this, with this ACC grant of rights thing. Yeah. And we had a texter. Same guy. It's uh -huh. like it's, it's only one guy, okay? Yeah. It's only one guy. He's hating. He's saying, man, I'm tired of hearing about this topic. Well, yeah, this yeah. topic constantly changes, Texter. Like, this is new developing information. Well, but te then Texter's listening. But then there's over a dozen people who text in really interested in this topic. Yeah, Texter. We, we, hey, listen, we appreciate you listening, Texter. Yeah. Hey, by the way, did you see we already had a game go final today? Oh, yeah? My pick. Did I say this already? My pick for the... World Series in the AL Baltimore Orioles diesel. The Baltimore Orioles won today 11 to 3 over the Angels. Uh, we did talk a little bit, a uh, little bit in, uh, MLB earlier in the program as all of a sudden I'm stuttering, can't, can't get my words out. The Reds also beat the Nationals today. The Dodgers beat the Cardinals 7 to 1. The Twins beat the Royals on opening day. And the Tigers beat the White Sox 1 to nothing in the battle of we both suck. Uh, but the Orioles is my pick. To win the AL, I have the Orioles playing the Dodgers in the World Series. Ooh, remember just a few years ago we were talking about the Orioles being a, a franchise that just wasn't spending any money. Terrible. And they were awful. Terrible. What a turnaround for the Baltimore Orioles. I have the Orioles. Man, they're good. They're really good. The glory holes. I, I have mean, Orioles. I have them in the probably playing the Astros or the Rangers. Uh, in the finals in the AL, and then I'll go uh, the, probably the Braves and the Dodgers. Well, for most people around here, the season begins in earnest tomorrow. Because That's right. Terrible weather in Philadelphia. Atlanta will take on uh, the Philadelphia Phillies tomorrow at 3 o'clock. Spencer Strider, Zach Wheeler on the bump, finally getting this thing going. Philadelphia. Diesel, yeah. say it right. Or Philadelphia. Oh, gosh. Philadelphia. What good sport team come, comes out of Philly? Are you kidding if me? If only they could make good food, they could be Grilladelphia. Ooh. 
Yeah. Well, they do have a uh, cheese steak. You don't like a good old cheese steak? Well, that they, they cook those on a flat top. That's not a grill. <laughs> Miss me. Any anytime somebody you don't think so? Throw it on a flat top. That's a frying pan, dude. That is not a grill. You're not a, a fan pan. of the flat top? No, I didn't say I don't like them. I'm just saying oh, okay. just stop calling it a grill. It's not a grill. It's a frying pan. A big frying pan. Yeah, like people are spending all these money on these what black Blackstone. stones. You don't like those? I think they're amazing, but okay. don't call it a grill. Okay, so you're fine with them as long as we don't say. Grill, yeah, flights on grill. Pan. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Big freaking frying pan. Yep. BFFP. If you curved it just a little bit, then it's a walk. That's right. That's right. I like, I'm a, I'm a fan of them. I am a fan of the more space to cook on. Absolutely. Where have we gone this segment? We are, this I mean, is, yeah, this is like the uh, scatterbrain segment. I like it though, man. We're covering it all almost wire to wire. Come on. Start dude. of the show, end of the show. If you are here, at the beginning of the show, and you're still here at the end of the show, you are a Tolo. We appreciate you for being so. Solo. Um, but if you did miss what we were talking about earlier, uh, Florida State seems to seems to believe that they have found an out from the ACC's grant of rights. I won't go deep into the story, uh, but basically Florida State is arguing in court mm-hmm. uh, with a new brief filed in Leon County in Florida. Leon. Uh, they are they are saying that the ACC has not been forthcoming, has been duplicitous. It's a good oh. word. That's a five dollar word. Um, with with the courts in Florida, in North Carolina, and in South Carolina, because the ACC has not yet turned over uh, the actual document of their contract of hmm. this grant of rights. So the ACC is essentially asking all of these courts to take their word for what is actually in their contract like you can't how do you sue somebody and how do you have a judge make a judgment if he can't read the document that you're actually suing about so florida state claims that the acc has not done their part uh number one in keeping up with revenue of the sec and the big 10 which they have not uh they also say that they have not uh basically been um operating in good faith by turning over the documents to the the people who need to see these documents through these court proceedings And by virtue of all of that, Florida State claims that the ACC has no actual legal standing Mm. to take any financial resources they may gain Mm. if they joined another conference. They basically say, once we leave this conference, we owe you nothing. So that's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out. It ain't happening. I don't know that they have a whole lot of leg to stand no. on here. Some, but there are some people who who are getting awfully rich off this case who believe that this may hold some standing. Of course, this obviously affects Clemson because they have already sued the ACC, and Florida State says that Clemson's suit has very similar verbiage in it. Uh, they this also very much affects Miami because they're in the same state. So they would there would be in state precedent. For how this is going to play out. Mm-hmm. If if a judge agrees that once they leave, the ACC has no right to their property anymore, well, then anybody can just walk. I mean, they could pay an exit fee and just go wherever they want to go. If they're saying you have no legal precedent to take our money from us. J.D. Wyatt says this guy talking about Tolos, calling them lames, barking up the road. Oh, tree. come on with it. it. J.D. Fire back. C.J. from Greer says a Blackstone is just a mobile Waffle House. Can we say <laughs> text of the day? Yeah. Do we have a segment for that? We text should. of the day? We should. That is great. A Blackstone is just a mobile Waffle House. Real quickly, uh, we are trying to increase all of our followings on stream, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Diesel on Radio is where you can find Diesel on Twitter. Give us a follow if you haven't done so already. Tweet us during the night, during the morning when we're not on air. We'll go back and forth with you on our discussions. Diesel on Radio. I'm at the Cole Bryson. We appreciate you helping us get to where we want to be. Diesel, final remaining minutes. I have not asked you yet. Opening days today, 60 feet, 6 inches. You're going on the rubber. You're towing the rubber. Speed is not a factor here, okay? Speed Don't worry about speed. I'm the catcher. Can you hit me with a strike 60 feet away? How many attempts do I get? You know what? I'll give you three. Give me three. I'll give you three. I'll be nice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be real with you. I haven't thrown a baseball in probably six years, six or seven years. And that, that, that hurts my man card, right? I don't have kids. So I hadn't practiced. I hadn't been throwing a baseball. Um, Before that, when I played baseball, I wasn't like the most accurate 
thrower. Uh-huh. I wasn't. I, that's why I played first base. I didn't have to throw the ball much. Uh, I'm going to say with three throws. No, you know, 60 feet is a lot longer gonna, than you think. I'm, yeah, I'm going to say no. So what if we go in the parking lot? Map off 60 feet, six inches. Yeah. I'll catch you, you pitch, and then vice versa. On the line. Oh, wow. I didn't know we're doing that. Bucks on the line. I say we get our boss, Mark Kendricks, to video this so we can prove it to our audience. 60 feet, six, inter- uh, six inches, three chances apiece with a regulation baseball, regulation, baseball, regulation mitt. Yep. 60 feet is a lot longer than people realize. When you stand on that mound, yeah. You tell the a lot of people I know a lot about six inches. I don't know a lot about six. Uh, yeah, feet. same. Listen, when people do the first pitch, a lot of times they'll let them get on the dirt instead of the rubber because yeah. it's a little bit closer. You see that sometimes when you watch people throw out the first pitch. However, Didn't you say Kim Mulkey hit a strike. She did, and then went and and threw dirt on the. I uh, love Kim Mulkey. You do I, like her. I, I love Kim. See, Mulkey. I don't like her. There's Kim a five Mulkey o'clock is a fight. Draymond Green of, of women's Oh my college god, <laughs> she's terrible. <laughs> Madcraft said, "Sounds like a busted car window. Not a bad uh, text there, yeah, Madcraft." Yeah, we move all the cars out of there. Well, this time of day, us. this time of day, you know, I don't trust us. Enough. No, you're right. You're right. I wouldn't trust us if I were you. Really? Yeah. Wow. Madcraft, you want to bring your car over here? Put it behind the catcher's diesel. Catcher's mitt. Come on, man. Come on, man. Really? Yeah. You don't have faith in me? I don't. I don't have faith in you. I don't have faith in me. But what I do have faith in is the Tolos to tune in and listen tomorrow as we break down Clemson. Arizona. Tolo. Tolos. We'll see you tomorrow. And we want you, of course, to find us on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, and on YouTube at the Fan Upstate. Hit the follow button, hit the like button, whatever they got. We'll see you tomorrow. Stream, streamers, Tolos. Tolo. Thank you much. We'll see you tomorrow as we talk. Clemson, Arizona, among many of other things.